Please join me in a salute to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome to the May 22nd, 2017 uh, Selectman's Meeting. Town Clerk presentation of Hampton's 2017 Top Dog. All right. Good evening. Good evening. Um, first, I just want to say thank you to the Board of Selectmen for giving me the authorization to um, get the sponsors to have our first very uh, very first Hampton Top Dog contest. We uh, started the program. Um, trying to promote dog owners to register their dogs on time. It's kind of a problem for us to be able to, to get uh, the dog owners to register in a timely manner and um, trying to limit the amount that we have to chase down <laughs> dog owners to, uh, to register their dogs. thought this would be a fun way to do it. I have a couple of town clerk friends across the state that are currently running the program and have been for some time, so I thought this was a good year to to try and go for it. Um, we couldn't have done the program without our sponsors. Um, so before we make the presentation to our top dog, I would like to um, recognize the sponsors that we have. Um, the sponsors that are here with us tonight are Sandy Kirby from My Dog's Mind. Come on up, I have a certificate for you. Thank you so much. Uh, Colleen Malizia from 603 Dogs. Thank you. And Scott Parker from Wolf Pet Nutrition Supply. Thank you, Scott. And I'll tell you that um, I was working at the window one day in January, and I had been thinking about starting this program for a couple of years and Scott happened to come up to the window one day and he said do you have any idea where I can leave some of my information uh, about my business and I said well I don't really know that you can do that here I said but <laughs> you might be able to help us <laughs> and, that, and that was, it was actually that day that I said you know what this is this is the time to do it you know it, there was a reason why he was at my window that day and I happened to be working out front which is kind of unusual um, so thank you Scott for kind of giving me the incentive to move forward with this. <clears throat> um, so without further ado, uh, the program was, the contest was drawn uh, randomly. Uh, Chairman Waddell drew the winning dog from um, the entry field of 314 dogs. Hopefully next year we'll get more. Um, we did have uh, 1,525 dogs registered um, by April 30th this year. So. Um, it is an improvement over years past, and let's hope that it only continues to improve. So without further ado, if I could get Carol Sullivan up here with Rocco. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll so Carol from the town of Hampton, the 2017 top dog awarded to Rocco Sullivan and his proud, o proud owner, Carol Sullivan, <laughs> This 22nd day of May, 2017, signed by James Waddell, Selectman, and James Cypher Town Clerk. Great. Thank you very and much. We are so excited. There is $645 worth of gift cards wow. from local businesses, all of our sponsors. Awesome. Great. So there's those. Okay, thank you. And if I may, um, just... There is one little surprise to this whole program. Um, I spoke with John Nyan of Experience Hampton, and if we can pull together a float for Rocco, we'd love for him to be in the parade as, to show off. <laughs> we we, we, we talked about that. Okay, perfect. He has a perfect um, Christmas hat, so Excellent. I mean, he definitely would. Excellent. Rocco, would you like to say anything? <laughs> 
<laughs> he's on. He loves to dress up. He he. We have a ton of pictures of him. So any pictures that you need or walk. He's a great dog. He's he's ten. So. So in addition to that, the, your, his picture will be displayed on the town office wall for the okay. full year. We'll be taking down all of the other contestants. Okay. And then uh, within that gift basket, there's also um, a tag from Wolf Pet Supply that says 2017 Hampton Top, top okay. Dog on it. And it also has the number one uh, dog tag for um, dry, uh, dog licensing. Okay. So, awesome. Okay. All right. Great. Right. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's very Thank exciting. You. All right, Max, you'll get that on the front page, right? Yeah. Headlines. Yeah, let's go. You guys want to do a photo? or? Sure. Yeah. I just want to also mention the other sponsors okay. that were able to make it here tonight. <laughs> if you say, want to go for a ride, he's going to, he's going to look awesome. <laughs> go ahead, Max. <laughs> so, other sponsors that weren't able to be here tonight are Citizens Bank of Hampton, Classic Clips, uh, Chura's Photography, and Play All Day Doggy Day Daycare. So, thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate thank you. it. <laughs> All right. So number two on the agenda is public hearing pursuant to RSA 41 colon 14 dash A proceedings amend and release of town owned deed restriction on formerly leased land second hearing. Diane Crabtree and Douglas P. Douglas Gearson 751 Ocean Boulevard release of deed restriction number four. The only structures permitted to be erected or placed upon said lot shall be one sing sing single family dwelling to allow two freestanding one family dwellings. This is our second public hearing on this. Uh, Mr. Manager, do you have anything on this? No, sir. It's uh, we need we need public comments so that we can put it on the official record, okay. and the board will be voting two weeks from now. Do we have anybody from the public that wishes to speak to this uh, issue? This deed restriction. Seeing no one? Board? Anybody on the board want to say anything? Mm -hmm. Seeing nothing? All right, this is the second uh, public hearing. We will have the third one at the next meeting. Yes, sir. And at that time, we'll vote. Okay, thank you very much. Public comment period. Anybody here for public comment? Seeing nobody? We'll move on to announcements and community calendar. <coughs> Regina. Um, I have nothing, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Mr. Bridal. I've got a couple things. On Thursday, May 18th, four members of the Hampton Fire Rescue received awards at the annual Portsmouth Regional Hospital Emergency Medical Services Banquet. Uh, firefighter Greg Schmushkin and Firefighter Courtney Osier received the Neuroscience Provider of the Year for excellence in care and su uh, for suffering, some a patient suffering from a stroke. Firefighter Schmushkin has 15-year member of Hampton Fire Department, and Firefighter Auger is, has a year and a half um, with the Fire Department. Two of our newest members received awards for care provided to patients while they were employed by their former employees. However, their recognition for this is a testament to the caliber of people they have hired here at Hampton Fire. Firefighter Adams Mills was one of two people who was recognized for the cardiovascular service line provider of the year and firefighter Gary Lemoyne was recognized as part of a team of the award for the trauma care provider of the year. Both Adam and Gary were hired by the department this spring. So I want to thank, uh, you know, it's nice recognition not only for the people that we have but the caliber of the people that we've, we've hired. Second thing I want to uh, remind everybody um, the work is being done on Drake Side Road as soon as the uh, school is, is out of school. Um, they, you know, they, this is uh, right there at the, uh, the old former trestle for the railroad. Um, there is a couple of bumps, and the town has marked them and put signs out, and somebody in, you know, it says bump spray and spray-painted the signs. It says fix, please. Well, we are fixing them, but... There's going to be a point in time that, that road's going to have to close, and they don't want to screw up the, the bus traffic. So they are waiting till after the school 
uh, gets out before they start working on it. So it isn't the fact that we're not doing the work. It's just it's a timing thing. So thank you. Thank you. Griffin. I just would like to wish everyone a happy and safe Memorial Day. Mr. Bean. Yeah, did we miss Mother's Day, Mr. Chairman? Did we wish all the mothers a happy Mother's Day? I'm sure we did. Um, I, I know Nobody you did. Nobody would miss Mother's Day. I know you Day. did. Uh, you know, we, we, we run this uh, little uh, this little boat here, uh, the town of Hampton, and we uh, we get wound up. But uh, a shout out to uh, the task force Shockey clan. They uh, had a member down at the Children's Hospital all day today, and uh, we wish uh, that family the very best in their endeavor. And uh, they're with uh, the entire town has their uh, our prayers and uh, their hope for speedy recovery down there in Boston. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. <clears throat> Consent agenda. Hampton Beach Master Sand Sculpting Classic Request for Use of Town Property and Services. Two, Oyster River Middle School, sixth grade annual walk and Ellen Gothel use of fish house. Three, Town Forest Cleanup Conservation Commission. Four, raffle permit for the Friends of the Lane, Lib Lane Memorial Library, Hampton Arts Network. Five, Hampton Beach Area Commission appointment, Rick Griffin. Um, six, notice of intent to cut, map 52, lot 1, Exeter Road. Seven, permission for projecting sign at 446 Lafayette Road. Eight, solicit solicitation permits, American Legion, post 35, and Boy Scout Troop 177. Nine, tax payment agreement and deed waiver parcel 121-1. Ten, poll petition 3035, Dover Avenue, Unitil. Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion that we accept the consent agenda. However, except on uh, number eight, the eight last one there says HFFCA. Yep. That is actually the Girls on the Run uh, is doing a lemonade stand yes. to, uh, with the profits going to the, uh, the HFFCA. Uh, okay. So that, just to make that note. Okay, good. We have a motion? Second. Second by Regina. All in favor? Abstain. Okay. Three, four up, four, and one abstention. Approval of minutes, May 8th, 2017. I'll make the motion that we accept the May 8th minutes. Second. All in favor? I'll abstain. Okay. I wasn't here. All right. Sorry. Four and one abstention. Appointments, Ellen Lavin, tax, uh, 2017 TAN. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, I am here tonight to obtain authorization from the Board of Selectmen to borrow a $4 million tax anticipation note. And I understand from Bond Council, I really need your permission before I go out and borrow. So that's why I'm here tonight. And could you could do me a favor? Could you explain exactly what that is? Tax anticipation note? Yeah, and why you're doing it and what what happens and I mean are you borrowing four million dollars no right what I it's more or less like a line of credit that you have on your home um, I used to go through citizens and I've asked TD but at one point they said you need to borrow all of it up front and I said I don't want to borrow it I want to borrow as we need right now I have about four million dollars in the account I usually spend about four million dollars a month the taxes, I'm sure, will be coming in, but most of the bills are not due until July 3rd. So for at least the next six to eight weeks, seven weeks, I may need to borrow. I don't anticipate it, but I'd like to have the money there. I'll make that motion. I'll second it. All in favor? And that is, that is for a $4 million tax in. Anticipation note, and then I should be back with the note. This okay. is just uh, permission you know, to authorization to go out and borrow. Yeah. And this is done every year, right? Yes, it is. And, just, and we haven't you know, borrowed in a few years. And, and, a, and a further comment, in, in what uh, institution? Provident. You're with the Provident Bank, and they were very uh, accommodating yes, to you. Yes, they That's are. correct, and you've yeah. saved quite a bit of money working with them. Yes, we have. Wonderful. Great bank and great work, Ellen. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, all in favor? Unanimous. <clears throat> Thank, Thank you. Much. Next, Christy Pullman. Monthly financials. Good evening. Everyone should have, I think it was the middle of last week possibly, uh, these financials went out for the month of April. They are actually on the website also. Uh, it's a fourth report 
for 2017 and the expenditure target is 33.33 percent in the revenue summary if you compare the year-to-date income from april of 17 to april of 16 the revenue is down 199,000. Uh, it's about the same ballpark as last week it's or last month i'm sorry we talked about there was a fema reimbursement last year for like 146,000 or 149,000 dollars and then franchise fees we were still for the first quarter of 2016 we were still getting the a portion of the franchise fees which we didn't no longer receive so revenue is pretty much level from where we were in 16. the month's total income was was 547,862 of that total motor vehicles came in at 208,189 dollars which is under the month's target by $64,636. The other major contributors to the month's total were interest on taxes at 53,202, building permits at 16,566, highway subsidy at 61,565, departmental income at 38,486, Rice sewer agreement at 51,520, parking lots at 45,893. The majority of that is related to the summer leases that we have in the Ashworth, Island Path, and Church Street because those invoices go out at the beginning of April because those leases start uh, May 15th. So most of that was related to that, not from concerts or anything. And the real estate trust at $69,981. On the expense side of things, you'll find that we are under the budget by $602,362, or 2.44. When um, In March of 2016, the year-to-date expenses were 504019 under, or 2.09%. So we're right in line um, on the expense side also with where we were in 2016. Election administration is at 51.7%, which is to be expected with the March election behind us. The total election registration and vital statistics is at 33.83%. I basically just went through and pointed out anything that was over the target for you uh, for your review. Legal expenses is at 54.97%, and the legal department as a whole is now over target at 37.89%. Outside counsel fees and litigation expenses are the line items driving the percentage over the target. Planning board is at 34.5%. Uh, it should be noted there though the contracted service line is the one that's over target there that's driving that line, that department up, and usually those are either semi annual or annual payments. So emergency management is at 221%. That's a thousand dollar line item though, so I think it's really only over by like a thousand. The chief, the police chief was going out uh, to get some grant money to cover the expenses on that line. Hydrants is at 49.06%. We made the first semi-annual payment in January for hydrants. Cleaning and maintenance is at 61.2%. Line item hired equipment summer is, dry, is a driving factor here. Snow and ice removal is at 99.6%. Highways and streets as a whole is at 39.4%. Uh, wastewater treatment administration is at 315 when you do not include the open purchase order for chemicals. They do a yearly purchase order for chemicals, which is almost $200,000 at the beginning of the year. So that drives that uh, line item up there. Library is at 3586 but this is related to their quarterly appropriations being paid at the beginning of the quarter. So they'll balance out by the end of the uh, second quarter. On page 16 and 17, you will see that the warrant articles um, and any activity that has occurred with those. Uh, in other funds besides the general fund, Fund 24 Recreation has a balance of $169,089, which includes beach sticker donations of 4470 And at the time of this report, no scholarships had been offered. I think now they have offered or uh, put out many scholarships for like their summer camps that are coming up. So next month we should see that on the financials. Fund 25, the Cable Committee has a balance of $244,268. Fund 26, Private Detail has a balance of 
Fund 27, the EMS fund, has a balance of $425,864. And the wastewater system development charge, uh, fees collected in 2017 total $12,270 with a balance of 97207 And of that balance, 43100 was approved in March by the board for expenditures. So once those expenditures come up in, that, that will come off of the 97000 and that is it for the monthly financials. Okay, so the revenue looks like we're pretty much right on target with yeah. those two. But can you do me a favor? Do you, by chance, know what the cable committee balance last year would be at this time? It would be substantially less, right? I would guess that, yes, but I don't have that $66,000 less. That would be my guess, yes. So that money going there is a good way for anything the cable company needs to not really affect the taxpayer in the future. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. I have no questions. Rick? Okay. No, thank you for your report. I appreciate it. No, it was a good report. I, I just, uh, the, the EMS fund, we, that doesn't include the vehicle that we're purchasing through there yet that we've proved. Uh, I do not believe that has been okay. expended that has been yet. I, yet. Okay. Yeah. All right. That is true. Phil? Negative. Thank you, Director. Um, just, it's on the website? It is on the website. Okay. All there. So, and when, when Regina talked about that, and you talked about the, the FEMA grant and stuff, the 199, that was figured into the budget that that wouldn't be there, right? Correct. So it's Absolutely. It's not something, you know, people shouldn't get worried saying, well, they lost 199000 that was supposed right. to be in the budget this year in revenue. The other thing is, is this the first time in a long time that the month's <coughs> target for automobiles is down? I think so. I was surprised by that. Right. That, yeah. That's it's surprising. almost always over. However, I have been starting, in, we talked about at the... I think the third and fourth quarter in 16 is when I started to adjust the revenue budget because after the audit last year, they had suggested that the revenue budget be adjusted at least quarterly. So I now adjust my revenue budget to be more in line. So even though she's under target, it's like a new target because I just had just adjusted that at the end of March based on what we had already collected for 17. So if we were doing that back in 16, then she may not have, we may have been over. Does that make sense? Yep. Yep. Um, okay, and everything else looks good. The, we're on target for all the expenses and yes. everything. Yes, yep. And going forward in the year, there's nothing that's, no, no budget that you look at that say, well, you know, come later on in the summer, they're going to need more money and it's not going to be there. Uh, not at this point. Uh, the snow line is up, so we have to, can't have any snow, but that's okay with me. All right. Um, <laughs> But no, I think everything it did seems... did have snow up north. When was that last week? Uh, Mother's Day. Yeah. Phil was mentioning yeah, yeah. something about Mother's Day. It was snowing up there on Mother's Day, I believe. So I was just trying to see the motor vehicles, because I have the 16 on here. So, yeah, see, this is a very good point. Even though it's over the target, motor vehicles at the end of April and 17 was 1064771 But in the end of... April of 16, it was 1046000 So we're still up from April of 16th, but since I adjust my target now, it made us so that we're not. Okay, good. Um, the other thing is, not to make more work for you or anything, but do people, does the public email you asking you questions on this? Does anybody? You on know, occasion, you get I get emails if, they're, if the report, the last month it wasn't up and it had been up there, it turned out there was a problem with the website. I don't know no, on that part, but, time, they but on the technicals of it, you know, or, or the specific department. On occasion, not a lot, but on occasion. Okay. On rare occasions, yes. Good. Thank you very much. Yep. And then do we have the bond on there too, or no? Is the bond on the agenda, Fred, or no? No? Not on there. Okay. Uh, no. Okay. Yeah, you might want to address it with you, Yes, I think we should all address it while I was here. Yes, I did send a so, memo yeah. to the board. Yeah. You guys should have all had yeah. a memo from yep. me. Yep. Um, as we all, as everyone knows, we did put the application in for the bond bank. If we choose to move forward, I had sent out a whole memo um, to you guys explaining all of our different options. Um, if we want to move forward with the June bond sale, then we do need to sign the loan agreements and move forward with that tonight. The deadline was actually today. I did get it extended because we can't, Fred and I don't have the authority to sign and move forward with that agreement. However, the project has not been bid yet. Um, so we don't have a hard cost, I guess you would refer to it as. So I had kind of given the board their different options. Uh, the concern with borrowing 
in this bond sale would be as if the project doesn't comes in for over the amount of the 1.1 million then we could be in a bind because of the fact that we've already borrowed um, and we would have to be borrowing debt to pay off debt the other options are if we don't include ourselves in this bond sale um, and we include it in the fall I believe in August is when uh, the Public Works Department plans to have a firm or a hard cost for the project we can get a ban which is a bond anticipation note instead of a tax anticipation note. And we would be able to be included in, in either the January or the June sale next year through the NH, the uh, New Hampshire Municipal Bond Bank. So that would be an option. Or we can also reach out to local institutions. We've already met with Provident. Ellen and I have. Um, we are reaching out to TD Bank. We reached out to Citizens. Uh, who does not do any long-term borrowing uh, with municipalities, so we can't do it through them. But we are reaching out to TD. We have a couple People's United. I uh, have a meeting with Ellen, and I have a meeting with them in June. Then there's also other agencies, like the one we used in 2014, which is PFM, uh, which is a financial institution, and the one that had gotten a recent rate of 1.97%. So there are other options for us moving forward. So it will be up to the board uh, to decide if they want to table this for now, the application with the bond bank, not knowing the exact cost of the project and do a ban or look to other institutions in the fall once we do have a firm cost. So, Virginia? Yeah, I would suggest that we don't, that we pull our application right now if we don't know what the amount's going to be. And we then don't either do the ban or perhaps I have actually, I talked to someone too at TD Bank. Oh, okay, good. So maybe we can either do that or do a, you know, a ban, but that will at least give us more time and when Public Works has a better <coughs> figure. Bill? No, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> also, what's, what's, what's the, is there any danger in not doing now? Fred so and I had a discussion and... What, what happens? Um, well, we can't predict what their interest rates will be in the future. I know the bond bank right now is saying that they're expecting the 10-year bonds for this June sale to be 2.1 to 2.5 percent. Um, that company, PFM, that I talked about, they just did a 1.97 for a 10-year. Provident, when Ellen and I met with them, they still have to work out some of the things that we are currently being offered from citizens and come back to us with whatever their fees would be. But they offered us a three and a half for 10 year if we um, left everything as it was. However, if we made them our deposit bank and moved most of our money from citizens to Providence, they would be willing to offer us a rate of 2%. So we have other options out there. Will the interest rates go up? Possibly. However, I also had provided um, different analysis for you in regards to if the interest rate's 2%, 2 percent, two and a quarter, two and a half, and compare that so that you could see the difference on what the cost is, you know, for a 10 year, 15, 20 year, whether the interest rate is 3% or 2%, you know, your savings. The fear with the doing the application now would be you have two fears. One, if the project comes in over, we can't appropriate any more money for the project because there was a vote for 1.1 million. The other issue would be is if it does come in less, that would be okay. But then, whatever we borrowed over, if it came in for one million, we'd still have to take that hundred thousand because we had already borrowed it through the loan and use it. We could pay off other debt with it, so it wouldn't be the end of the world. Um, but you'd be borrowing debt to pay debt, you know. Okay. So. So there are negatives either way. Yeah, I think Fred and I talked about it, and it's kind of one of those catch twenty twos. I don't know if he has any thoughts, but. Um, my recommendation would be to uh, nullify the existing application and go with a ban that we can send back out to bid. Okay. I'll make that motion. Made Second. a motion by Rick. Seconded by Rusty. All in favor? Unanimous. Okay. Thank you. Do you have anything else for us? That was all. All right. Thank you very much. Yep. Next on the agenda. Ed Tinker, Chief Assessor for 2016 abatement, Abatements. Good evening. Mr. Tinker, good evening. Good evening. Um, tonight I'm presenting 12 uh, additional 2016 abatements. Um, 
six of pending approvals, uh, totaling $2,733.31, and six are pending denials. Um, can answer any questions. I can also let you know that uh, next month uh, will probably be the last visit for the 2016 abatements. There's about 12 left to, to address, and uh, those will be presented next month along with a final spreadsheet for the board to be able to see this year's um, total uh, totals regarding that. Okay. Rusty? No questions. No questions. Bill? Yeah, Ed, thank you uh, for this work. And uh, just as a matter of uh, more globally on your department, when there are uh, um, abatement requests mm -hmm. in terms of uh, the public's right to know, uh, these are small ones. If there's larger ones, what what is uh, uh, established law and precedent for the public's right to know on, on that entire process? I, I, well, again, I believe uh, Mark might be able to answer this better than I, but um, as to uh, commercial entities with income and asset uh, um, breakdown or, or documents that are confidential, they are confidential during uh, the process of an appeal or trial. Um, and so, you're, so you're saying the documents are supporting documents right, are confidential. The, the, it's public to know that a company has filed an appeal or an abatement. Okay. But a lot of the documentation within those abatements and appeals okay. potentially would not be public information. So the public does have a right to know, is entitled to know if there are companies or, or taxpayers, if you will, uh, more correctly, that right. are seeking... Uh, abatements. Yes, I, I do keep a spreadsheet. That's what we'll next visit. I'll, you'll have a spreadsheet showing the when we had approximately 70 abatement applications filed. The, that whole list, which you've been dealing with, in, you know, 10 or 12 at a time, um, you'll have that. It'll, that that's that's public information. That is public information. Yes. Uh, yeah. Is is that something that is easy to put on the website? Um, we could break it down to just the names of the people who filed. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of that would have to be okay. deleted. Yeah. Uh, but we could, yeah. I mean, the actual, right. just the the name of the property owner or, or business entity could be put on there. Thank you. And, and I think uh, in, for terms of transparency, uh, and uh, uh, the public has a right to know um, what's going on. And, and assessed value is public information at any rate for all taxpayers. And uh, I'm concerned that the uh, the public is aware um, uh, of that process, and mm -hmm. it can lead to sub the, these are small numbers, twenty seven, thirty three. Is that correct? Twenty seven, thirty three. Yeah, that's yeah. you know that's neither here nor there, but it's important to each person. But when we get into some of these larger properties, I think the public uh, deserves to be warned on that, and they might have an opinion or information on just what the board of selectmen's uh, and your office uh, uh, procedures are exclusive of the confidentiality of the, any supporting right. documents of the taxpayer. Yeah, I mean, you agree I, with that? Uh, to, to list, the, I mean, we do keep a list. When they when they file, we I compile a spreadsheet. Okay. So the, the names, that's not an issue again. And then the amounts of the abatements they're requesting? Well, they're only, we look at what we have it assessed for and what their opinion is, but okay. that actually until the selectmen the board makes a decision on my recommendation those numbers can be as a, as you know less or more um, a lot of times the commercial ones become a more of a detailed appraisal type situation there isn't a lot of specific um, opinions of value that are initially given by those companies sometimes mm -hmm. or so they're just appealing and will submit appraisals in the future or whatever when we do that. So, um, but again, we can put the assessed values, we can, I mean, I do that. I have that spreadsheet. Because as part of this package, it's, it's and, and again, it's, it's not that consequential to the town as a whole. To, right. uh, but if we do get into larger uh, properties and uh, mm -hmm. the, the reduction in taxes that folks pay and that methodology, I think, bears scrutiny by the public and I think it's one that should be available to the public arena. If we're talking perhaps six figures or more for a property, I think, I think the public is interested in it. I know I am as a taxpayer. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mark. Do you want to uh, say anything to that point? But I, I think he covered it. Thank you. Covered it fine? Yeah. Okay. Just wanted to make sure. Yeah. I'm fine, Ed. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks, Ed.
you did approve them. You did make a motion to approve. Oh. I'll make a motion that we approve <laughs> the uh, tax abatements as recommended. Second. All in favor? Unanimous. Thank, Thank you, Ed. Okay. Have a good Thanks night. Thanks. Carl McMorrin from Aquarium Water Company and an update on the water and everything. How are you this evening? I'm good. How are you? Good. Thanks for having me. sir. I'm um, happy to introduce Dean Lawrence. Uh, I'm here, right? He's our Director of Engineering. Good evening. And Troy Dixon, who's been here before, Director of uh, Rates and Regulation here. Uh, tag team on this uh, update on our uh, on the water system uh, activities and plans. Here's a list of what uh, we intend to speak to tonight. All oriented and interrelated towards uh, providing reliable, uh, safe, and cost-effective water service to the community. Um, as so you're probably all well aware, we have a water main project uh, in progress out on uh, Lafayette Road. Started last week. Um, so far, they've not done much besides dig test pits to find out what's what's actually underground. Um, but it's in, in progress, and we expect that to be finished by Labor Day. Uh, basically, we're putting in about 1,400 feet of new 12-inch ductile iron main uh, down more towards the west side of the road <coughs> uh, in order to take out of service uh, about the same length of old 67-year-old uh, cast iron main. Uh, that's smaller. Um, work's being done at night, 10 to 10 p.m. to uh, 6 a.m. in order to minimize the disturbance to the local businesses uh, and traffic. Uh, there is a detour, basically. Um, southbound traffic gets diverted down High Street to Academy and back out Winnicunit Road. Northbound traffic is still pretty much open, except on those rare occasions when I've got a quick crossing the road or something like that. So uh, we are putting weekly progress updates up on our, uh, our website, as well as there's information through Public Works and Experience uh, Hampton. As you well know, this is uh, adjacent to the sewer replacement project Public Works is doing this fall. Uh, right now, the existing main is too close. It's going to create all sorts of complications when they go to, to dig that up. And there's benefits. It increases the flow. Down through uh, that particular stretch of Lafayette Road. Um, also, our sources and storage are all north and west of this location, so it enhances the ability to flow water down towards the high school and all the way down towards uh, the beach. And uh, hopefully, um, this is just phase one of a, of a beautification project for the whole downtown area where we want to upgrade all the utilities, um, get them either underground or relocated, and be able to. Uh, <coughs> basically enhance the whole downtown experience, make it more welcoming uh, towards uh, visitors. So Experience Hampton has taken a, a big lead in that. Uh, so hopefully all this gets done by, uh, by 2020. And also just want to say special thanks to, for the support we're getting from the Public Works Department, uh, just in coordinating all this, uh, especially Chris Jacobs and Toby Spanhauer, and especially Jen. Um, she's really facilitating, keeping everybody in on the loop on, on this project, uh, so it goes smoothly. I uh, just want to give you an update on the drought, or the non-drought as the, it currently uh, stands. Uh, things have been wet recently, and uh, no part of the state is considered to even be abnormally dry. Um, that's why it's all white and not you know, bright red like it was last fall. The extreme. Uh, drought conditions that we experienced. I would like to encourage residents to uh, continue to use outdoor water wisely. Uh, it does help minimize the potential for fewer future rate or uh, water use restrictions if it should get dry again. Um, and we also have regular updates uh, on, on basic water supply and, and any potential drought on our website. Um, I guess one silver lining of, of the drought is it did get people to think about you know, the capacity, or the production capacity. And uh, so I've raised some questions that I received about whether we can support uh, current or future demands uh, in our system. Just give a little quick recap. Um, this is a good question, um, both in terms of long term planning and uh, in the immediate situation we have with, uh, with the Wigan Way. Um, 
So essentially, it was it was a historical, rather unusual event. Things like that, at least historically, only happened about twice a century. Um, and it did necessitate some um, unusual responses, so to speak, or things we don't do very uh, routinely. But uh, in terms of our long-range planning, it's really sort of a blip. Um, I can say now with the advantage of hindsight um, that if it hadn't been for the pump breakdown that we experienced in July, we probably wouldn't have gone any farther than voluntary um, lawn watering uh, restrictions. Um, really, the shortage at that time was due as much to the pump breaking down it wasn't like the water wasn't there, we just couldn't pump it out of the ground for, actually for a relatively uh, short period. So, and also the restrictions were limited just to lawn watering. We didn't really have to impact any businesses or other residential uh, uses. So, in some sense, it's a lot more cost effective over the long run to employ short-term restrictions like this when we do get a drought event. Uh, rather than try and justify the cost of having a lot of big you know, production capacity for something that's only going to happen um, twice a century. But it doesn't mean that the improvements aren't needed for the, for the long term. Uh, and we've actually been evaluating the need for additional sources since the previous drought, which ended around 2003 or so, even though it wasn't nearly as, as severe. And for those of you around in those days, there was a, probably a five-year period there was a moratorium on new services uh, being added to the system, uh, which was an inconvenience uh, for some. And um, when the moratorium was listed, uh, lifted, uh, DES still expected us to look for new sources uh, and increase our production capacity. And over those intervening years, we did quite a bit of work in terms of source exploration. It actually culminated in the current project uh, that's uh, titled uh, Well 22. And that well was actually drilled in 2012. Uh, at that time, we actually put it on, on hold because we had a fairly high level of what we call non-revenue water, lost water through uh, leaks and main breaks and things like that. Uh, so we targeted a reduction of that, uh, and we've been quite successful that we've cut it roughly in half in those five years, saving <clears throat> about 120 million gallons uh, over the course of a, of a, of a year. Um, and then also in the intervening time, we've, we worked to improve well, the management of our production capacity, our long-term demand projections, and really overall the planning processes. So last year, we sort of implemented this uh, a standard, it's what we call the margin of safety, where we look at our long-term supply capacity and our long-term demand projections. And our target is to have a 15% buffer margin of, of safety, uh, safety, so to speak. Um, um, so that actually triggered us to start and move forward with developing Well 22 last year, which just coincidentally was at the height of the drought, or the worst part of the, of the drought. Um, so really as it stands today, our wells uh, have the capability of meeting our current uh, demand except in extreme drought condition. But our margin is pretty low. It's, it's less than 5%, which is too close for our planning comfort. Um, it's probably not enough to meet uh, what we see coming in terms of growth in, just in Hampton, let alone our entire service territory. Um, so that's why we're proceeding with the development of Well 22. With respect to Wigan Way, it's like 6,000 gallons a day. It's really a relatively minor increase compared to everything else that we, we see coming. Uh, going to Well 22, um, this is a bedrock well out near Well 7 off Little River Road. The preliminary testing shows that it has a high volume, uh, possibly enough capability to be our biggest well uh, when it's fully put in service. And so far it shows uh, good water quality characteristics. Uh, <clears throat> in order to bring it into service, uh, a large groundwater withdrawal permit from DES is required. Um, we propose a test level of 940 gallons per minute, which is pretty high. Uh, we, want to, we want to test it at a high level because we want to maximize what we can permit to get out of that well. We don't want to go too low, come back in some period, 10, 20 years, and have to go through the re-permitting process again at that expense just to get more water out of it. And so we'll conduct a major pump test uh, later this summer uh, where we'll determine what it's capable of in terms of production volume, whether there's any impacts on water quality, uh, and really what pump level 
can be supported without adversely affecting uh, other wells, other private wells in the neighborhood. So there's a public hearing scheduled here for this room in two weeks, uh, June 5th. Um, that's followed up by a, about a six-week public comment period uh, where people can submit comments to uh, DES and they'll issue the final test protocols uh, towards the end of July, which will then open up a window in, in probably August or maybe September at the latest to do a 10-day pump test um, at, uh, at that relatively high level. Um, should lead to final issuance uh, per, or issuance of a final permit the last quarter of this year, maybe the first quarter of, of next year, which would be followed by installation of the pump and the piping, and some treatment improvements uh, in the second quarter. So hopefully we'll have, uh, have this well in service uh, by this time next year. Uh, however, pumping the water is only half, half the equation. We still have to treat it. Um, so I'm going to pass the... the the uh, baton over to Dan to speak to uh, to that. You want to you come up there. Whatever works for us. Good evening, and I'm Dan Lawrence, the Director of Engineering. So, let's see if we get this right. There we go. So, <clears throat> one of the things we look at as we look at treatment and long-term growth is where do our sources lie within the community? Can we consolidate sources <clears throat> for treatment? Um, right now we have a, a number of, of sources spread out throughout the community and every time you have <clears throat> treatment spread out you end up with multiple facilities which you must maintain, repair, as well as improve in the future. Um, so we've been looking at this as a, as, a, as a company for a while, but we do have, so if we look at, uh, oops, what did I do, Carl? There we go. That's fancy, Carl. <laughs> uh, um, Mill Road and Little River Well, so you can actually see those um, blue circles there are actually uh, well sources and we have seven when you add the new well at uh, well 22 we'll have eight wells and five treatment facilities that we have to maintain so what we're looking at and i'm just going to move this on um, with these sources they were put in in the 50s and 60s when basically when treatment you basically would take groundwater right out of the system put it in untreated so you have a pump a motor in the system with no treatment um, was very common. So the facilities weren't constructed to have treatment in them. So whether it's pH control, whether it's uh, you know full corrosion control, an orthophosphate, or some some other treatment that may be needed in the future. There's these facilities are very small. Um, can we do have a picture of one in a second? So what we're looking at is either long term to have to upgrade each facility um, or consolidate the facilities. Um, these particular wells along uh, this stretch are about 2,000 feet apart. Um, we spent some time walking around and um, looking at possible routes to connect them. Um, but we do have our, uh, our property there that extends that connects all, th all of the wells so we can get that done. So this is uh, just an example uh, of a facility. And as you look inside, this is what happens when you have to do treatment in a tiny facility. Um, and so you end up with uh, some tight spaces, some smaller, um, you can see the drums there. Um, those are actual chemicals, and you have uh, chemical feed systems. And um, one of the things that you have, we would like to be able to get to is what we call a little more of a bulk delivery. It's more economical, obviously. Chemicals are always better purchased and delivered in a bulk instead of toting them around. Um, so this is just one example of, uh, I believe this is well seven in this particular picture. So we have deficient uh, chemical storage, and actually when you look at it, we'd love to be able to, so what that it means to our staff is they're going out and, and toting around chemicals more often. Uh, you know, not the end of the world, but definitely not always the safest thing to do if you're working with chemicals every day. Um, and we have some cramped wiring and some other things. But one of the things that we're looking forward at is, you know, you have um, the Flint situation that occurred, Flint, Michigan, with uh, there's going to be an update to the lead and copper rule. Uh, which will impact um, everyone in the water industry um, one way or another. It's unclear exactly how that's going to come out, um, given the, the present state of regulations. But it's likely going to require um, more corrosion control, um, whether, whether it's going to be adding a different chemical or a different process. So we want to make sure as we plan that we look for the future, make sure we have adequate space and we'll be able to cover all that. 
if we were to have to um, implement something at each facility right now, we don't have the space to do it. So we'd have to expand every facility. And um, that seems expanding uh, five treatment facilities. So adding additions, you know, new roofs, and then, and then adding that. And so we've been comparing that against consolidating these facilities together for the long term, which definitely has long-term benefits both from a cost perspective as well as operation and maintenance, as well, I think, um, a better control of uh, chemical treatment as a whole so we can do it more practically. Um, sorry, I should have put that one more time. Redundant systems as well. I'm just going to go this problem. So we are in the process of um, finishing up our alternative analysis. We go through an alternative analysis design execution phase within our company. We're um, using uh, Wright Pierce as a consultant, one of, one of the better consultants in the area, and working with uh, my department in engineering planning and Carl and his staff, working through the various issues and developing um, some scenarios that make sense both for um, the wells on Mill Road as well as well 7 and 22. Um, as we bring well and 7 and 22 back online, um, we have to decide whether to expand that facility substantially because of the increase or bring that water all the way over and match it up with our Mill Road water treatment plant and consolidate everything. Um, tentatively right now, it looks like installing a transmission main to bring that water across versus um, building new facilities about the same cost. So if that's true, in the end, we would consolidate that treatment instead of having another treatment facility. So. Um, centralized treatment is always easier um, and more cost-effective in the long term from operation and maintenance standpoint as you move forward. So obviously, it, uh, centralized treatment does give you bulk chemical storage, uh, better disinfection. Um, we can actually achieve four log, which is a level of disinfection, which we don't have the ability to do now. It's not required, but we'd love to be able to do that so that we have better um, better handle on our water quality. It gives us a better ability to handle backup power in a consolidated basis. Um, and better automated control systems. I'm going to move on to Exeter. Um, so, you want to do this one, Carl? Want me to? Can I ask a question? Oh, sure. That's, Please uh, do. At this point, um, what do you think about um, the encroachment of those houses that are being built down there near Little River Road? There's a request to build seven more houses that come close to the water facilities. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, it's not ideal. Uh, there's a little bit of the uh, sanitary radius for the new well that's over in that lot. Uh, we actually talked to the developer. Uh, we put all the, the constraints we put on the other side of that development in place in terms of, you know, not using fertilizer on the lawn and things like that. And they've also they've agreed to give us an easement for the portion of that uh, sanitary radius on that property. They're doing some things like put some signs up to make people aware that it's uh, water water supply area, actually uh, putting a wooded buffer along the back side, which will prevent any further development in there. So um, I think it's a pretty good compromise uh, that addresses really the really think that people are going to pay attention about fertilizing their grass? Well, we're going to keep an eye on them. And, you know, we'll <coughs> so that's something that you, the water company, is prepared to do? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think we've tried to leverage it as best we can. The uh, fact is we don't own the property, and the developer has certain rights to be able to do some things. So the best we can do is get the conditions that help them um, uh, mitigate it somewhat. Thank you. Uh, Dan, before you sit down, in terms of the uh, costs involved and the things that have been discussed, all, all these costs are things that would be added eventually to the rate base. Did I get that right, Troy, at the next rate case? Uh, that's right. Yeah. Well, 22, as I understand it, uh, the cost is estimated to run about half a million. Did I get that one right? Ballpark, yep. Yeah. yeah. Now, the cost of the consolidated treatment plant, can you give us an idea of what that would run? Yeah, I mean, right now we're working through phasing. Um, I just want to just go back. Um, part of it is, you know, you want to spread out. So um, you have where it says private. That's our, our driveway. That's where the um, roughly where the facility is going to go. And as you move down the page, you really have well 6, then well 11, then well 9. And so phase 1 would be well 6, and the well's up near where it says private there in our driveway. Um, and then we would do future phases. So we haven't broken the phases out. It would be um, a couple million dollars overall, um, but we would be spending that money one way or another on either individual facilities long term or consolidating facilities. So when we finish that, we'd be more than happy to come back and give you real numbers. That we feel are, are you know, how the phasing is going to work. 
that's where we are right now. Is there some agency approval that's needed for that particular project? Yeah, so I mean, we'll go through DES for that. Yeah, DES will approve the plans. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, how do you want to mark this? We're having questions at the end, or is it? Uh, you get take questions now. You, the questions along the way is easy enough for us. Okay. If that's what works for you guys. Questions. Go. Well, you're the water one. You're, <laughs> you're the water rep. Well, all right. I was going to wait till the end, but so DES will. You're saying DES will obviously agree to this. You know, they'll give you the permitting because why? Because you're providing us with cleaner, better quality of water. Well, so D DES is the regulatory agency when it comes to water supply and water treatment. So. Right, but, you know, and I want to let everyone know, I've been talking with Kyle, I talked to Kyle and John Walsh a couple times, and I've been learning a lot about Aquarian as a company, about your parents, your international parents, and the more research I do, it's come across to me that Aquarian, part of the reason why Aquarian is here tonight, I like to, to say, is because you're part of the town, you provide water for the town. You know, we have our quarterly updates from Public Works. We have our quarterly updates from Police Fire. Well, where's Aquarian, you know? I get a bill, that's all I know. You know, or Kyle comes in and says we're going from quarterly to monthly billing and everyone's upset with Aquarian. So I know that you, you have the same type of situations that we as a town have. We don't own, we, you know, we have a water company, but our Public Works has these very, very same infrastructure needs on the wastewater side. Just as important as the drinking water because water's got to go in somewhere and it's got to come out another, in another place. So my thinking is from now on, we continue these updates. You know, really nice that the engineer came. Troy, thanks for coming. Um, but I think we need to work more together, more closely together because you're providing our clean water, our public works is trade is treating the clean water provided to our northeast region of the United States. Same problem is happening all over the country. Now, my main goal is to get some money for us. You know, you as a private company have a little, you have different type of opportunities to offer us because you have investors. The rest of it, unfortunately, comes from the ratepayer, which is the taxpayer to us. Same person, same people. So what we really need to do is get alternative source of funding. You only have so much money, we have so much money. State really doesn't have any money either. So where is it gonna come from? It's gotta come from either federally provided or it's gotta come from private. It's the only, the only people that have it. So I'm hoping that this can be the beginning of a new type of a relationship that we have with our water company. And I'm gonna do more research and I'm gonna get on D NHDES, DOT, DRED, Everything that this town offers, the money goes out. We just had our chief assessor in here. Was it like almost $53 million was our tax commitment last year? Millions go to the schools, 2.2 million parking, all this stuff coming from Hampton. What do we need? We need $4.5 million to replace our wastewater infrastructure. That seems like not that much money when you look at it that way. So by working together, I think we will have a better chance of accomplishing what we need. We need our water infrastructure. We need our wastewater infrastructure. You, you're the experts for the drinking water. Jen and Chris are the experts for the wastewater. Let's get together, let's get it done. Whatever we need to do, the more people that we have working together, the bigger fight we got. And that's what I am really trying to accomplish with all of this. So thank Thanks. you very much for coming. Appreciate the help. Okay. Should I continue? Yep. Yeah, I've got uh, some. I've got some. I want to jump in on some, if I can, Mr. Chairman. Uh, mm -hmm. Carl, you talked about pumps, uh, and there was a maintenance issue. Um, what, 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 what exactly happened with that pump? You said it wasn't a capacity problem. It's it shorted out. It's actually one of the problems that Dan uh, talked about, and having these. It's one of the deficiencies we have in our chemical spaces is because we've got. Basically, chemicals and spaces that aren't designed to hold chemicals. The fumes are getting out, and they're affecting the electronics. And at that point in time, they got into the, um, I mean, it was a cumulative effect, but they shorted out the windings in the pump and caused it to fail. So. Okay, and how old was that pump? 
I don't know. I have to look it up. Not, not terribly old. Yeah, um, and and I'm no water expert, um, but those those pictures don't look like it's a very sophisticated uh, treatment facility, uh, and it doesn't look like there's been much investment uh, on your company by your company uh, for that. And and I think um, the pictures you just showed, and we're talking, you're talking about the expense of having a consolidated treatment facility versus different. You've talked about eight wells, five treatment facility plants. Is that what you said? Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, it's the town of Hampton. It's water. And we would encourage you, I think, and I, I think there would be a general consensus um, from everybody in this town, is that we want <clears throat> a real intelligent, uh, dedicated, uh, and not cutting costs, uh, and not waiting for the Flint, Michigan verdict uh, on what standards are, and not... Um, waiting for the federal government standards, nor DES, but Town of Hampton standards, and that we want state-of-the-art pumps. We want uh, a, f a plant where your treatment uh, uh, facilities aren't boxed in that degrade equipment and threaten our water supply. Would you say that's a fair assessment? Yeah, and that's exactly where we're going. Okay. Um, I, we actually had, I didn't bring drawings, forgive me, but I'd be happy to with whoever wants to, Public Works, and start that process once we finalize. We're within weeks of finalizing what we're going to be doing. Okay. How long have, how long have you guys owned the com company, uh, the operating rights in town for, you, for the water company? 2002. 2002. Okay. Um, I, I would just say that I would expect a more vigorous uh, strategic uh, plan. Uh, I, think, I think that uh, you're behind the eight ball on that. Uh, in that uh, when you're talking about that type of facility and it's degrading uh, the actual equipment that treats it, I think that's a problem for your corporation. And it, and it, led, it led to a, uh, uh, an almost uh, inability to meet water demand last year, so you said. So I think that's, that's a real issue, and I think that's got to be addressed. Uh, what are your treatment costs per gallon of water? You've got that facility right there that you just showed. You've got chemicals. What, what, is, what is your treatment cost? Total treatment? cost, power and chemicals, is about $300 per million gallons. Okay. And I'd have to look up the exact number, but the majority of that is the power component. Okay, so you're talking uh, this new well 22. That's going to do almost 1.5 million gallons a day. Potentially. Uh, so realistically, it probably won't get permitted for that as much okay. as we're asking for. Okay, so you, what do you think you're going to get out of that? You're, a, you're an industry guy. I, I don't want to speculate. Okay. Well, <laughs> I you think said it'll be a lot. Based on the numbers you gave me, I just extrapolated and did the full, 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 full uh, bore. It's uh, a million and a half, and let's say it's even half that. So you're talking 300 bucks for a million gallons of water. And uh, I would say there's plenty of room to uh, dedicate it to consolidated maintenance, to upgrade uh, the capabilities, to have a strong uh, backup pump system, uh, just like you do in a boat, just like you do anywhere. Just, uh, the fire captain over here is that uh, you build in that redundancy and you build in that capability, and it hasn't been done. And you've been on board for, for a number of years now, and it shouldn't take other incidents to be going on. And I think, I think there's a, a deficiency there. And I think uh, working with Regina, that you'll uh, uh, work to correct that. And uh, there's a lot of us have experience in Concord. Uh, you know, this is Hampton. These are our standards. We don't wait for the bureaucrats and the people up in Concord to tell us about our water. We have the highest standards, both the guys back there that are reading and, uh, um, and you folks, is that we define the standard and not people in Washington either. Mm -hmm. And that's why people are like this on this board, is to speak like this, because that's what they think, because it's their water. Um, there's uh, a consensus that uh, town wells that serve Hampton are in other parts. Not a consensus. I've, I've heard opinion that uh, um, wells are outside of Hampton that serve Hampton. Are all of our wells that serve us water within Hampton? No. Where are they at? Northampton and Stratum. Okay, Northampton's part of our, our outfit, right? Okay, got it. Um, thank you. Uh, Representative uh, Nessner is uh, in Concord working a lot of water issues. Are you in contact with her? Mm -hmm. You are. And what kind of contact have you had with her in terms of cancer clusters? Yeah, we've had conversations about regulations for the PFCs. and. Mm -hmm. 
Are you going to be part of her uh, task force that uh, was uh, um, published in uh, Max Sullivan's paper uh, this weekend in terms of uh, water quality and, and uh, a scientific uh, um, uh, committee to uh, address these issues of water quality? If offered. No, I, I would suggest, and I, I think the board would, that you uh, give her a call and get on board with that. It's, it's the essence of her. And you don't go far from here where these cancer clusters um, are problematic. And, uh, um, water safety. What, what, uh, what, what, what is the uh, general uh, condition of the water? It meets all, all regulatory standards. Mm -hmm. That's what the definition of safety is. There <clears throat> any contaminant levels above the maximum levels, in, in our case, and not our. Okay. And uh, did you send this PowerPoint slide to us? No. Okay. Part of what Regina is talking about is, is more communication, and uh, um, we we need this in advance. Uh, well, I apologize. We finished it. At yeah, and you don't have to apologize, Carl. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, you know more more advanced notice. I'm happy so. to send it to you after the fact. Yeah, and then then we can do questions and email you questions, so it can be part of your presentation. We don't have to do um, this and, and take up time, but it's it's much more fluid. And uh, when will Well Twenty Two be online? Second quarter of next year, if uh, things work out the way we expect them to. Okay. And the permitting process is lengthy, I guess, is the better expression to that. Sure, so. sure. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> okay. Comments noted. Um, I just wanted to, uh, excuse me, I went back to talk about something. I'm going to get forward here. So, um, and we have talked about this in, so Exeter Road, the tank is, we had, planned on actually rehabilitating or repainting the tank this year. It's actually still in really good shape despite its 35 years in service, which is great. And so we went about starting two years ago <laughs> trying to understand how to take the extra road tank out of service. It's the only tank in that water level, the upper water level, and still provide appropriate fire protection and provide service to all our customers. And so we developed a, a scenario that would involve a number of uh, temporary or temporary infrastructure improvements that will allow us to do that. Um, through that process, um, Carl and his staff and my staff work together to try to determine whether it's sustainable um, because it's, it has a risk point to it. And the conclusion we came to was that although it looks on paper like we could do that safely, um, in order to do it effectively, we were concerned that that it may actually not work well. Um, so we put all that on hold right now. Um, and we started, and we had been looking at this as well, as, as potentially looking at <coughs> constructing a second tank. Um, and the reason being is this particular tank, X Road, we have multiple water levels, and the system supports the fire protection for all the water levels. So if I take it out of service, I don't just affect a small area, I affect the entire system. And so if we could have a redundant tank, uh, we'd have more storage, which is obviously better for fire protection. Um, at the same elevation, so we'd be able to do that, and we'd be able to maintain the tank without any risk. So we'd be able to put, the, put a new tank in and then be able to rehabilitate this tank. So what, what happens when you only have one tank, you end up doing that project really late fall, then early spring, which therefore costs more as well. So we're in the process right now of evaluating um, the possibility of a new tank, whether it be a second <laughs> tank adjacent to Exeter, or um, another location on the site. So, um, questions? I can keep going. So, um, there are some benefits long term, and we're trying to identify. As you know, we have a number of tanks in the system. Um, so, one of the things we're looking at is if we add another tank, what can we remove? Because um, every tank is eventually needs to be rehabilitated, and it's not inexpensive. So, if we could add a second tank with an understanding of how we would be able to eliminate another tank in the system when it has to be rehabilitated, we'd actually be able to save money in the long term or at least be neutral in the long term. Um, and that's that's our focus. So, which And having uh, gravity at the top of the system would eventually help us eliminate some of the pumping, pumping storage that we have now. So it offsets by retiring some of our older tanks and enhancing some of the better performance. So we're in the middle of evaluating that process right now. Um, and should be done in the next couple months with what we think is the best decision. And obviously, we'll we'll come with you. We can have a meeting with Public Works and Virginia if it makes sense ahead of time and get it out um, in terms of where we're trying to go with this. So, 
Any questions on Exeter? All right, Carl. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. And Mr. Chairman, I've got a question that was on the Little River Road. And okay. May I? Yep. Uh, and, and I guess this is to call maybe maybe to one of you scientists, but <clears throat> um, you had it talked that you don't think in answer to Rick's question, and I don't know if the, the horse is already out of the barn on this, but um, has this subdivision been approved? Um, I think that they've been, <clears throat> they've had things that have been approved at the uh, zoning board, I understand, and it's, I'm not sure what happened this week. I wasn't at the last planning board. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't think it's Yeah, I was, and I, I believe they, it was a long list of conditions, and I'm Memory serves me right. They, I believe they they approved it, and they did approve it. And then, in terms of uh, you, you uh, had some uh, reticence <laughs> about standards uh, with that approval in proximity to the wellhead. Is that correct? Uh, I don't know if I'd describe it like that. Um, personally, just as a scientist, I'd like to see you know miles and miles from from my wells uh, to anywhere else. But that's just not reality. So uh, the thing is, is you know, it's a subdivision. A lot of Things going on there. Same thing that's happened on Little River Road and the other roads around there. We can't do anything about that. We've got some conditions on here that will help minimize the risk of any contamination. Conditions on what? Pardon me. You've got. You said you've got conditions on there. What, can, what does like that mean? They can't use fertilizer. Um, they're not using salt on the road. Uh, they don't have any fuel storage. Or significant fuel storage on on the, the uh, properties with any of the new construction um, of observation wells that they've agreed to put in for us. So it's and, something and we can keep an eye on. That was part of the development uh, approval process? Yes. <clears throat> and those are conditions? Yes. And are those, uh, um, in terms of uh, uh, the prohibitions, are those in the deed? I don't know exactly. I, it's either lots. in the deed or in the homeowners association documents. Yes, they are, in fact. And then what about provisions for testing? That's well, something that we do. Um, and, and what are your exact procedures for that, for something that's close to the wellhead? Uh, we collect water samples um, monthly or quarterly, uh, depending on how busy we are. Um, my guys will be driving through there to observe if they're doing anything like putting fertilizer on, on the properties. Are there penalties for... Uh, we would report food? that to uh, the planning board or the town, whoever's responsible for the town to enforce the conditions of that subdivision. That'd be the homeowners association, not the town. And what are the penalties for that? There are no penalties. Okay. Well, that's 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 a, a leadership uh, function and, and something that uh, we need to address. I, I guess my question would be: My office recommended that those test wells be moved behind the homes instead of in front of them, because the homes themselves are contaminant sources. Did they actually approve that, or did they they abandon the wells on the? Other, su other side of the subdivision and put the new ones on the edge of the road? One, one well's in place on the south edge of the road. Uh, the other one's to be put in down at the end near the cul-de-sac. Yeah, um, then there won't be any sanding or salting on that road at all because we'll contaminate those wells eventually. <clears throat> yeah. I don't, uh, I don't want to go with the, yep. the situation they had in several towns in Massachusetts with the same problem that test wells were contaminated in relatively short order, which then caused severe problems with the well itself. Yeah, and I, and I guess I, I'm interested in more uh, scientific and concrete uh, uh, regulations and in, in opinion into the planning process, uh, and especially if you're building a new well, and uh, uh, and there should be penalties um, for people that violate that, uh, that uh, are, are fertilizing the lawn. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I'd be interested in, in what your procedures are to remind people and communicate with them, because people have busy lives, and in, in, in all fact of the matter, they'll forget and they'll get into that who's got the greenest lawn syndrome. And um, the uh, the new well, well 22, is that near um, any new developments or developments uh, that uh, could uh, harm harm that well in terms of fertilizers? Well, for one thing, it's a, it's a very deep bedrock well. I didn't mention it, but it's like 500 feet deep. Mm -hmm. So the immediate uh, threats are a lot less than some of the other wells in our system that are shallow or sand and gravel wells. Um, okay. So basically, having that 400 foot radius really minimizes. I mean, there's there's no way to absolutely eliminate every every risk, but it minimizes the risk of surface contamination that may get into it. And a lot of the wells coming from tens, maybe 100 miles away, as it percolates from the mountains to the ocean. Um, I mean, we pick up PFCs in all of our wells, regardless of where where they are. They're all down at 
trace levels. Some of them are in close to any kind of real sources, but we pick them up. Uh, water moves around. Um, so, you know, we, we try and, and uh, optimize the security around our wells, just like <coughs> for surface water supplies, you try and protect the waterhead mm -hmm. or the well, watershed. Um, but in some cases, you're, you're forced to rely on treatment to remove those contaminants. Yep, so and I'm, I'm so far, our, our wells are very high quality, and we, mm -hmm. we have actually minimal treatment to meet the standards. I'm, I, I think there's room for improvement in, in that effort on your company and uh, to uh, inform, to reinforce, to inspect, uh, and to be vigorous about that, uh, those, those properties that are in the perimeter. That's just my opinion. And uh, I know that uh, our uh, water select person probably agrees. Yeah, I do. I think there always is room for improvement, but I do want to say that Aquarian, I mean, there is, we have, like you say, immediate water issues around us, right around us. And, Carl, you are out there, you're testing it, making sure that it's good on a regular basis. We get our monthly, what is it, monthly water quality report. It's actually annual. Annual? <laughs> no. What is it? There's not water quality meetings on well, You're that referring one? to the water, water supply update that really focuses oh, okay. on available supply. Right. But we only publish the water quality reports once a month, although if anybody calls and asks, we give many up-to-date up information. So it's just a matter of how much Okay, well, I've been looking at a lot of Aquarian information lately, and water quality is, they're high up there, but like you say, always room for improvement, and especially if we're going to be putting new wells onto the system. And um, there was something I wanted to ask. Oh, we had talked about the redoing the margin or updating the margin of safety mm -hmm. analysis. So it's, well, we can weigh whatever's going to happen there. And also for our new development with the new well on, yep. maybe updating that for the board so they could see uh, a more current yeah, we can version share that. of what. We can share that. We did just recently update that. Okay. Just yeah, part of our annual uh, capital planning process yeah we do it annually I mean I would suggest there's some great questions here tonight and thoughts um, maybe for our next time we come in we can maybe go through some topics and get those see if those meet you know we, we're doing some you know capital tonight maybe next time we can do you know wellhead protection what we're you know what we do to give you a better idea of what we do in so maybe we can come up with some topics to cover next time uh, as well as some you know and we do this with a number of communities in our, in our regions. Great, Dan. And Great, call. Thank you. Because then you can learn what we do as opposed to try to understand what we do from the outside. Thank you. So, and we can bring other people. We have a watershed group. We have a water quality group. So, um, you know, that, that's all they do. So. Thank you. That would be great, I think. Shall I continue on? One last topic. Let's talk about Wigan Way. Uh, and really, I just want to address some questions. We're really not here to argue the merits one way or the other. Uh, it's something we're compelled to do at this point by <coughs> by DES. Uh, so it will be hashed out between DES and, and the PUC. Um, but I, I've got some questions that seem to indicate some, some misconception, but really about how we function as a regulated uh, water utility. And actually, they bear on more than just Wigan Way. It's, it's uh, a lot related to... To growth, but uh, first, just a little bit of background on on Wigan Way. If uh, if you haven't been out there, it's this pointer works. This little extension up in, uh, on the uh, town line between uh, Stratum and North uh, Northampton. Um, it's a 43 home sub subdivision uh, on the Stratum side. They have failing wells. They have uh, high levels of arsenic that has put them into violations. Uh, and from DES's perspective, conveniently, they're only 40 feet away from, from our system. So <clears throat> you can see from their point of view why they would uh, favor integrating their system with ours. Uh, just a little bit of timeline. One of the questions I get is, you know, why is, why is Aquarium pursuing this? Why are they initiating this? It's really not our initiation. Wigan Way initiated the conversation back in October of 2015 uh, in response to DES pressure to do something about their problems. They were encouraged to do that. Uh, last summer, DS actually issued a, a temporary uh, connection emergency permit because they were uh, so short on water. Uh, that that interconnection was removed in September, uh, at the end of the summer. And then, as you all know, we had conversations with both Hampton and Northampton. Uh, we listened to your objections. We valued your relationship with us more than adding a few extra customers. 
So in October, we withdrew voluntarily and unilaterally from this, this conversation uh, or this proposal to uh, connect to, to the, uh, the two systems. Um, that turned around, DES issued their order uh, compelling us to connect to Wigan Way uh, at the end of March. Um, one of the conditions was to make a petition to the PUC for temporary connection that was sent in in, in mid-April. Uh, PUC finally approved it on March 10th, and uh, that became active uh, last Tuesday. Um, so where it stands now, you've probably heard that uh, your appeal, uh, Northampton appeal, has uh, been accepted by the Water Council. The hearings on that are to be scheduled. As of the time I left my office, I had not heard anything back on when that may be. Um, and then the other condition was for the uh, for petition be made to the Public Utilities Commission for permanent uh, connection, and that's that's yet to be scheduled um, as well. So that's that's sort of what the landscape looks like, just maybe for background more than anything else. Um, so I'm going to pass the ball over to uh, Troy to answer a couple of questions here related to the cost and in, impact on rates. Um, Wigan Way is a good form, a good stimulus to answer this, but really I, I think the answers apply to any kind of main extension that the, the company receives. Uh, uh, right. Carl, before you do that, you had uh, this temporary interconnection last summer, and I believe it's actually 47 homes rather than 43. 43 homes. There were 47 lots, but only 43 were developed. Okay, because one of those lots, uh, one of the original 43 was divided into four. Uh, as far as I understand it, only one of the lots has not been developed in that group of 40, total of 48, just so you know. But maybe. In any event, um, you had experience with them last summer and at a time when there was the severe drought going on, you had the water lawn watering ban in Hampton. Uh, this group of homes, uh, of course, is uh, a number of homes uh, which also have in-ground and uh, above-ground swimming pools. What was your experience with their adherence or not to your watering ban? Uh, I was told that they did not uh, have any lawn watering going on last year. Last year was a little bit different than this year. They only took water when they needed it. They would basically top off their storage tanks and then run as long as they could. Uh, this year it's different. They're, they're taking all their water from us at this point in time. Thank you. So there were some questions about what it would cost uh, should Aquarion actually acquire the Wigan Way system. And I thought the easiest way to do that is really to break it into two areas, really, the cost of actually acquiring the system and then the ongoing costs of the system. In terms of the initial acquisition, there is no cost to Aquarion to actually acquire the system and there would be no cost to our customers uh, in the same way. Uh, the best out analogy I can think of is to a developer type situation where a developer goes in and develops some real estate, they build a water system, they pay for it, construct it, and effectively they just turn it over to us uh, at no cost to operate on a going forward basis. Wigan Way is effectively the same way. No cost to us to actually acquire the system. On a going forward basis, if you look at the costs, typical costs for us are return on investment, depreciation. Those two pieces wouldn't exist for Wigan Way since we never actually made any investment, so there is no return on investment. There's also no depreciation component. The only remaining components are the cost of actually running the system as well as any property taxes we would get on the pipes in the ground. Um, from what I understand, and Carl, correct me if I'm wrong, but it probably would cost us a couple thousand dollars a year to actually run the Wigan Way system. Um, and rough calculations tell us we'd get about twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars worth of revenue from the system. So any of the costs um, of actually running it are going to be you know, far outweighed by the revenues we're going to collect. Um, so in terms of the second question about would would the acquisition result in an increase in rates? It's sort of the opposite, where um, it, if costs stay as they are, this would actually reduce rates for the rest of the customers in the system, or conversely, they could have the effect of allowing us to stay out just a little bit longer from a rate proceeding. Given this is only 43 homes, the more likely scenario is that um, 
you know, it would just act as a reducing factor for the rates for everybody else in the system. Um, but this isn't a scenario where acquiring the Wigan Way system is going to put any costs on the backs of our existing ratepayers. Mr. Chairman, Mayor, <clears throat> and uh, the folks from Northampton were uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago or a month ago, whenever, <clears throat> and, and they're they're concerned. They had a couple. Uh, they had a lot actually, um, and and they were concerned about the camels and those under the tent. And as we watch uh, uh, these water quality issues, and, and in particular uh, these these cancer clusters, um, what other uh, what other communities, what other developments um, will come into play and be at risk and, and need emergency water systems uh, or emergency water supplies? And and uh, you probably can't answer that question. I can't answer that question, but. Um, it is uh, with with more effort and more research and more study. It's it's going to become more exigent, and their their concern is is valid, and our concern is valid, is that more people. Will, oh well, there's there's a query on, and and that is a phenomenon that that we need to look at hard hard, uh, and and protect our water source, and when we talk about these development rights and, and building those those homes. Um, those are things that needed to come into play, and uh, the the issues of taking care of your own water aren't something that you let get to an emergency situation if you do some bad bad planning as a municipality, and then you go to the people and you say secondarily uh, in terms of that, and that's a whole issue, but it's 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 primary. Secondarily is we have paid for this water system. We have done the construction job. We have paid for this new well. We're demanding better pumps. We're demanding a bump plan, a, a, a safety plan of pumps ready to snap online. We want better infrastructure from you people. We want a consolidated treatment facility that doesn't look like something in my garage. Uh, that's where you need to go. We've already borne those. <clears throat> We're having the meetings here. We're performing that effort. Uh, we have commercial enterprises to run in this town. These guys down here and back are director and, and uh, um, co-director, assistant director. They run the hard part of the water business. That's putting it back in the Atlantic Ocean after we all have our way with it. Um, and uh, that's a cost that these communities don't don't uh, incur. They simply use their their septic, uh, and that that's that's a cost that we that we incur that they don't incur. So our costs, I would, I would say, Troy, uh, are substantial, and they're, they're already established in our operating costs. And these two gentlemen here, that's our biggest department sitting back here. It's bigger than fire and police combined. So I would, uh, and, and perhaps the board would look at an alternative view and say that our, our costs are substantial, and the cost to uh, let people come out of that system without any buy-in uh, is problematic and that you just come on board into our water system and you've got your pools and you've got this and you've got that and then you can you can have green lawns <clears throat> so i i uh, i think that needs scrutiny and i know our esteemed esquire is going to bring those up but uh, this isn't a free hookup and your twenty five thousand dollars of revenue isn't the issue it's uh the camel with the nose under the tent and it's just how expensive it is for this community this community in particular not northampton not rye not stratum this this is the dog wagging the tail and uh, <clears throat> the state relies heavily on it as you know uh, for revenue we, we we live and work here so it's very important for this board to consider it's an important two points to make and uh, thank you mr chairman yeah, in terms of the cost per gallon that's being paid for the bills that our users get of course have the two components the consumption charge and then the service charge would the Wigan Way people similarly pay <coughs> both of those charges, or are they just paying for consumption charge? Well, no. If, if look, currently Wigan Way is being served as a single metered source, just as if they're another seasonal hookup. Uh, so yeah, there's a service charge, volumetric charge, plus the Wicca surcharge on top of that. If if they were to become part of our system, then each individual home would become a regular metered customer, just like everybody else. Pay the same service charges and volumetric charges as everybody else. I appreciate your comments, Philly. I mean, we're not here to justify this one way or the other. We're 
as I said before, we're compelled by DES to. I know you are, to Carl, and you're going to do what you're told. And right. Yeah. But and to what Phil's saying, and I mean, I know we've talked about this before several times, but what DES is doing is wrong. We have the investment. We sustain ourselves. We sustain ourselves because of you. We sustain ourselves because of them. All right? We're sustaining ourselves. And then on top of that, we're bringing all this revenue to the state. All right? New Hampshire is one of the 12 or 13 states in the country that aren't bankrupt, like traditionally bankrupt, where their liabilities don't exceed their assets. Mm -hmm. You just heard our budget right on. You know, we're like 2% underspent. All right, so we, we can sustain ourselves because of you, because of you. Now, having all these people come in and take from that without giving into it is what the problem is. And the problem is not you, and it's not us. The problem is the PUC. <clears throat> the problem is NHDES. Because what is their job? Their job is to, PUC is to regulate what goes on between all of us, and the job of NHDES is exactly what it is, the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services. Clean water. A way to treat clean water and put it back where it belongs. All right, so that's what the fight is. That's what I need you for. And that's what I'm hoping that, you know, in my mind I'm working and concocting this idea by talking to as many people as I know on the subject. And I want the support because we need Aquarian just as much as they need us and what the other people, our relationship needs to be between us and Aquarian and everything else that we don't agree with needs to be fought amongst with who we don't agree with. But you're doing your job, we're doing our job, and Chris and John are doing their job. And that's simply what it is. And we need Aquarian as a private company that's supplying our water to help us in what we need. And we can't have people just coming into that and taking it for nothing. And that's what's happening. Uh, just uh, for clarification, the, uh, what's happened in past is that there have been years, as outlined in the DES order, where the Wigan Way Homeowners Association, whose maintenance has been performed by Penichuk, has utterly failed to meet the orders of DES. And now, after years of that, they suddenly turn to you and say, okay. okay, give it to us. And one of the things I'd like to know is, I take if you, if you go on a permanent basis and take over their system, are you not in, going to be incurring the expenses of maintaining their pumps from the point where you supply the water to pump it out to their residents? Or are they going to continue that? I know you said there's no cost for acquisition, but in terms of maintenance, aren't you taking the place of what Penichuk did? Yeah, so the couple thousand dollars a year I was talking about was sort of the ongoing cost. I don't know, I assume that's something like meter reading and uh, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, operationally, I don't see us running their system. They're, it'd be expensive to try and rehab their wells. I mean, it's just, there's no point uh, if we're forced to take over the system of, of running their wells. We can just feed water directly from our system. Yeah, we would abandon their sources. Yeah. Those are not sure. quality sources but that we would want. What I'm really asking, they, they they have to pump it from their wells to get to their um, to their homes, and, and they've not done a very good job of maintaining what they have. Wouldn't you be responsible for their pumps, replacing of their pumps? No, we'll just, we'll just decommission them, take them out of service. So our, grade, our hydraulic grade line would allow it to be serviced without pumps, without their sources, so... In essence, of it, they're gravity fed by pressure, okay? The thing that, that bothers, I think, most of us that look at that is the record of maintenance in the entire system. That includes their piping system. And you're buying what they haven't maintained and haven't maintained since they put it in the ground. That will ultimately cost something because it's ultimately going to either have to be upgraded, fixed, repaired, whatever. If the system is a poor system, and some of the areas could be, who knows? Nobody's yeah. dug it up to see. No. Well, you know, we'll dig it up when. It yes, but you of... may be required to replace it all because yeah, we... they're very small yeah. lines. They're not to the same standard you use as a regular water utility. They're a, they're a homeowners association, and that's quite a different standard. <coughs> uh, you could be in the same fix that other people could be if DES steps in and says, "Oh no, 
you can't do that, you've got to now change it to this. And they've done that before, we just don't want to go there. Their record with DES is very poor. DES has ordered them, ordered them, just like they ordered you folks to step in and take this over on at least three separate occasions over a number of years. These people did nothing. DES turned their back and said, okay, Aquarian, you walk in, take it over, you take responsibility. We, we, That's not your fault. It has nothing to do with you. It has to do with DES, and it has to do with the fact this homeowners association refused to follow a legal order from a state agency, and they refused to enforce it. Now they're stick, sticking it on... The aquarians back which we ultimately will have to share in the cost for later yeah we've run into more situations like this in connecticut in the last yeah. 10 years we've had a lot of these systems which have been involuntary acquisitions for us and one of the things that's come up especially with pura who is connecticut's version of the puc is they're looking at these systems very closely because they're saying they're in poor condition and they need a lot of this investment and it shouldn't be on the backs of the existing customers so one of the things we go through during this process of the acquisition is really looking hard at the system and saying, are there some significant investment needs that are going to have to be put in? And then the decision at that point is, to the extent that there are, we're not going to put those on the rates of your existing New Hampshire customers. We're going to put a surcharge on the rates for the Wigan Way customers if those requirements are there. So we've experienced that in Connecticut. We don't want our existing customers subsidized subsidizing these customers, they're going to pay for it if there are those investments. Yeah, you don't have a choice in New Hampshire. The only way you have a choice in New Hampshire is to form a separate water company for Stratum. Then you can put the costs on them. Otherwise, it's shared your whole system. Uh, uh, I've had discussions I've about... I've been there. I know that's the way it happens here, and I've been there because I run some water systems in other towns, and well, that's well, another town. Yeah, while they would share the same existing base rates... We believe there's a way to put a surcharge mechanism just on those customers. Well, system. let's put it this way. Those customers have has satisfactorily disallowed themselves to follow state law, disallowed themselves to maintain their existing system, and they've got the political clout to do it. And I suggest to you that that's going to be a very difficult hill to climb. It's like Mount Everest twice over. I don't think that's going to happen in New Hampshire. It's never happened before. It's not going to happen now or in the future, simply because the Public Utilities Commission and DES aren't going to go there. They're trying to shed all these private systems because DES is now responsible for them. The state doesn't want to send, spend a penny that they don't have. <clears throat> that's why it's being shed to you folks to take responsibility for it. It's not your fault. Yeah. But, you know, there is a law in the state that basically says... If you have to have a separate rate for or a different town that you're supplying, you got to have the rate for everybody. Either that or you got to form a separate company for them. Yeah. That's the law in the state, and that's a difficult law to, to get over. It can be gotten over, but you're going to have to get through the legislature to do it. I don't think you're going to get there from here. Troy, you said you had some discussions with some agency about that idea of surcharges. Uh, had some discussions with the legal counsel about how we would proceed. Of, of PUC, though? No. Or, or DES? Our own legal counsel. Oh, okay. Now, their issue over there was... It's a challenge. Not lack of water, but they had an arsenic problem. Is that both, what it was? Lack both, of water. Both insufficient water and high arsenic. Is arsenic treatable? It is. Mm -hmm. And, and they've known about this for a long time. They, they, they've not invested in, they're not, not going to defend them for right. their maintenance record, their operation record. But like right. I said, we're, we're doing this because we have to. Oh, and we understand, <laughs> I understand that. This is good practice you know, for you saying, guys, you know, for the Water Council. And they, uh, the week, so they, haven't, they haven't done nothing to help themselves, really. Last figure we had was $48,000 to solve their problem. They're not willing to even invest that for the arsenic. That doesn't sound outrageous for arsenic removal. Basically and this is the same agency that is ordering us to fix our own problem. Yep. Even their own problems. Yeah, they're actually, yeah, not just our problem in my opinion. State, possibly federal issue. <laughs> it's a real mess, but I know you're not responsible for it. You're just being ordered to do this and you have to do it or they have the right to step in with a court order for you. Well, well unlike Wigan Way, we're not willing to, to take a notice of violation ruin our brand mm -hmm. if we can't anything do about it so we're just following following the order 
So do you want to finish up or? That's it. Yeah, that's it. Now, well, if you have any questions, we'd be happy to ask. <laughs> <laughs> any more questions? Any questions? <laughs> we appreciate I would that. just like to say, Carl, that um, I read your article. A friend of mine is in the water business, and um, that was in the, the Water Journal. Oh, yeah, New England Water Works. Yeah, yep. And it was very impressive. Yeah, thanks. Why didn't you ever bring that here? Yeah, and I read it too, and I got it from them, and it was really good. I, I think there's so much information in there, I understand much more after I read it. I, well, I apologize. I, I, to be honest, it didn't occur to me that uh, you'd be interested. It was something I did for for a uh, actually a, a New Hampshire Waterworks meeting, and then I said, well, I've already got this done. I'll see if I can do it at a New, New England Waterworks meeting. And the condition of doing that was I had to publish it in the in the journals. So. Well, it was yeah. very good. I was. I thought, well, this article is interesting, and I looked at it, and when I saw it was you, I thought, wow, it's <laughs> amazing. But you did a good job on it. Uh, you know, it's one of those things you, you sort of do because it, it was actually a meeting we hosted here, and as a host, I had to do something, and, and I put it aside, and went on to the other thing else I have to do. I think the newspaper I read is going to have an article next week by Cheryl Lassiter that is going to talk about the history of the fire department, so it might have some of. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm sure there's some connections there. Carl, I have a question on <clears throat> all the new development down in Liberty Lane, mm -hmm. whether you're going to have the supply for that. Yeah, we uh, actually I'm waiting to finalize the main extension that will close uh, a loop around right. Liberty Lane side. East, comes in around the, uh, whatever it's called, it's called now, so that the, the uh, current water main that goes under the highway can be abandoned and they can use that sleeve for the sewer. So I expect that to happen this summer. Uh, I don't know for sure. Mr. Chair, I think with the board's mission, Carl has mentioned that they're putting out uh, things on their website regarding the construction that's going on in Route 1 and yep. keeping people up to date. With your permission and the board's permission, if they want to send that information to us, we can put it on our website too. Thank you. Yeah, yeah sure. Hey, one more question for Carl. Go. As I do every time you come in here, Carl, you know what I'm going to ask you. Why well, we don't have water on the other side of 95? <laughs> it's because nobody's come forward to pay for it. It's it, it was one of the reasons I wanted to bring up the Wigan Way thing is like all almost all the system growth isn't at our initiative. It's developers coming in and paying for main extensions. I mean we're sort of we're prohibited from you know building water mains and they will come. That's considered speculation with our rate ratepayers money. So uh, Almost all the growth that you've seen in, in town has been funded by, by developers. Occasionally, there'll be a transmission main we need to be put in, and there might be some services tapped off from it. But um, that's the answer. That's why there's not much beyond 95. And nobody's nobody's really been willing to come in and pay for the mains. The best analogy I always think of is like when uh, subdivisions built, they build a road, and then you approve it and take it eventually. And so it's the same way. You, you don't build the road for them so they can build their houses. And we go through the same process. Well, so. my thought, I mean, the houses are already out there. Yeah, I know, I and know. It's all, it, the I whole familiar. area, it's already done. I mean, the houses are there. Uh, and then, it, you know. Well, if anybody wants to get together and figure out how to fund a water main extension, get the state to order it. I've had a few calls from folks out there, you know, when are we going to run a water main? And, but it's been like less than, less than a handful. So that's why. Yeah, getting on there. How much do you think it would cost to fund a water main out there? Oh, is that a million, million dollars a mile for pipe. So it sounds like if you win the mega box. There you go. Yeah. Well, I mean, well, there's a system, yeah. That's just a ballpark figure. It could be higher. You know, in that case, you've got to cross over the bridge or the turnpike somehow. Yeah, yeah I think over getting over under a 95, however you choose to do that, is a, a challenge in itself. And the turnpike commissions, they're great people to work with. Great people. <laughs> right. Carl, so, that, uh, that Liberty Lane. Uh, switch that you're talking about doing that's being paid for by the private users yep. there yep. yeah thank okay. you there are no other questions thanks for coming in thank thanks you for your time. thank you john you're welcome thanks for your time that's a lot of information yeah yeah it's a good thing thanks for the drive too i know some of you came from no that's okay some distance have a nice evening thank you thank yeah, you thank you all right, town manager's report. Mr. Chair, members of the board, um, your trash and recycling will be picked up as a resident on the regular schedule for Memorial Day. The transfer station will be open that day from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. The public works office will be closed. 
The Aquarium Water Company is in the process of replacing its water main on Lafayette Road between Winnicott Road and High Street. Work hours for the actual work when it starts will be 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. and the boards just authorize us to put their construction schedule information on our website if they would provide it. Uh, Public Works is in need of summer help. The department has positions available for summertime beach crew, the highway division, rubbish collection crew, and positions at the wastewater treatment plant and the transfer station. Please apply at the Public Works Officer. Call 929-5924 for further information. The State Department of Transportation construction work along Route 1 from Park Avenue to Seabrook and on 101 at the Route 1 continues. Please be mindful of the narrow detours and workers in the public highways. The beach is open, and we remind everyone that glass containers are not permitted on the beach, either town or state. Please dispose of your trash and the waste containers provided. I have a couple of other things, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the town will be holding an auction uh, for equipment being held at the Public Works Department. Uh, that's all small equipment on uh, June 17th. Uh, the time will probably be 9 a.m. Uh, we also have um, a public hearing that's coming up. The Department of Environmental Services for the withdrawal permit application, uh, which you heard about for Aquarium Water Company. Uh, we'll have that information uh, out there on, on, the, uh, on our website. The public hearing is scheduled for Monday, June 5th. 2017 at 7 p.m. in this room, and it will be televised. Also, um, we have a note here from Brock's, uh, the paving and construction work that they're doing out on uh, Route 1 should continue through October 20th, 2017. That's the finished cleanup and everything else. It should be done before Labor Day with the primary work, but they will be out there doing cleanup and so forth until October 20th and the American Legion Parade for Memorial Day, um, conducted by post number 35 for Hamptons, uh, is going to be at the Beach Memorial, and this is uh, on the 29th, Monday, at 8 a.m. The parade will commence at 11.30 p.m. from the parking lot next to the fire station. That's it, sir. Okay. Regina? I have nothing. Thank you. Rusty? The only thing I have is uh, Fred, along with the Public Works, uh, the Rec Department is also looking for summertime employees at the parking lots and for the sure. parks, too. So. Oh, yeah. How old do the kids have to be to work for the town? Um, 16? 16 is the minimum age. 16. 12. 12, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Phil? No, sir. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Okay. Thank you, sir. Next thing is uh, Hampton Beach. I asked for this to be put on the uh, agenda uh, because I just want to make a clarification that we had a PowerPoint presentation last week, and that that PowerPoint presentation was the opinion of one member of the board. It was not a consensus of the board. It was not an official voted on PowerPoint presentation. I would like to say from my own point of view as one member of the board that there are problems at the beach, and I do not appreciate them charging when they're not providing services but the beach is in good shape there have been a lot of improvements down at the beach there is a working relationship between the state and the town it's a marriage that took place in 1933 and it can't be separated there's no divorce in there and we need to work with the town i do not personally believe that any one of the commissioner the uh, director or the beach manager needs to be replaced. And I think people need to know that the beach is in good shape, it's open for the summer, and it's a welcoming place, and they will find a very clean, appropriately set up beach. That's my opinion. I'd like to open it up and go around to the board and anybody else that wants to say anything. I would like to say that definitely room for improvement and as far as replacing anyone, I'm not going to get into any of that, but I do want to say that the Departments of uh, Red Develop De uh, Department of Revenue Economic Development Recreation Economic and DOT are two of the agencies, along with Aquarian, that I feel we need to work together with. 
the financials that uh, Selectman Bean had the other week, 2.2 million in parking revenue. That was 2015 from from our parks, which is fine. That's what you know. That's what they're there for. But at the same time, that money is something that they constantly get on an annual basis. It's 2.2 million. We don't know what 16 is yet. We don't know what 17. But these are things that are being budgeted for. They know they're going to get roughly probably $2 million from Hampton for revenue and parking. Okay. So what if we have issues that we need to address? What, where's our, you know, the marsh pipes, my favorite topic, $4.5 million infrastructure that, in my mind, my opinion only, is an emergency. All right? They're the lifelines of that beach. They're seven feet under a marsh. We can't clean them. We can't look at them. We can't figure out what's wrong with them. Why is that just pawned off on the town? Because if something happens to them, there's going to be a lot more than the town that's not going to function properly, the state. And then it's going to go into the marsh, and that's going to go into the Atlantic Ocean. And guess what? That makes it a federal issue. So then, again, my argument, everyone needs to work together. Because without one department, guess what? The others aren't going to exist the way, they're, the way that they are used to existing. So that's all I want to say as far as Hampton Beach. And, uh, right, that's it. Things have gotten better over the years. I spent 10 years in Concord, and before that we had the, um, the old seashell down there. Uh, we worked hard at getting, when I was up there, getting the new the seashell and the new bathrooms. A lot has been done. A lot more continues need to be done. If we're going to start collecting meters at April 1st or whatever the date it is, if they've got employees that can pick up money for the meters or write out tickets and they should be able to have employees that can pick up the beach. Uh, I must say we had a very busy week down here last week. Uh, there were a number of people. We had, uh, rumor has it, there were a number of senior skip days at a number of the, the cities and towns around us. And uh, a lot of people were at the beach. Our parking lots were, were open. Uh, the parking lots the ones we could have open were full. Uh, we had some employee issues because we didn't have enough employees because it's preseason. I understand Public Works had some work to do down there because of cleaning. Our police department also did. The fire department at one point had three ambulances running straight. So it's we have to plan for that. Well, the state has to remember they need to plan for that too. It's not. Um, you have those good days, and if they can afford to uh, pay people to uh, write tickets and, 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 and uh, man the parking lots down there, then they can afford to have some people down there to clean the beach. I know they've, done, they've, they've tried to do a good job. Uh, they're trying to do better. One of the things I not happened to notice last night was, or the other night when I was down there was, at 8 o'clock the bathrooms closed. Well, they still collect the meters till 10. Why are the bathrooms closed when the meters are still collected till 10? Uh, so there's stuff that can be done, but we need to work with them. Um, yeah, I just, I, th that's all I can say is we need to work with them. We need to continue to work with them. We need to continue to keep that dialogue open. Thank you. Rick? <clears throat> yeah, the, this week, Fred, and the town manager and Jim Waddell, the chairman, and John Nyan, the chairman of the Hampton Area Commission, and myself met to discuss some of the drainage problems on Ocean Boulevard. And it's going to be addressed somewhat at the um, Hampton Area Commission meeting this Thursday night. So I invite anyone that uh, has anything to contribute, you're more than welcome to come to the meeting. And there's always a time when you can speak at the beginning of the meeting. It's going to be um, held here. What? It's going to be held here. Yeah, but I'm talking about the Hampton Area Commission meeting. Yeah. They, on Thursday they, night. They usually meet in this room. No, it's going to be at the fire station. It's going to be a fire station this time. Okay. And, uh, and there are people that do want to come because uh, the people, uh, two, at least two people have contact, three people have contacted me that have other issues on Ocean Boulevard, and that is the appropriate place to go. Uh, like someone had some comments about crosswalks, yeah. and 
you know, they, people in the area up to Winnicott Road, can, the woman, she says, I'm used to considering this the forgotten wasteland. And she's talking about her crosswalks that she's been working on for three years to get. And, you know, she has, you know, so people that do have issues, they need to come to the Hampton Area Commission and bring it forward because we're looking for th ways to, problems that we need to work on, especially coming up next year. Our, this is our last meeting for during the summer. So I'm looking forward to see what the state is going to do, and I know they're, con um, they're coordinating this effort with Mr. Welch, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, so I'm looking forward to see what's going to be the result of this collaboration. Me too. <laughs> Thank you. Nope. It, sorry, is that the Oops. movie on the 30th? The meeting that's on the 30th? No, it's the one that every that's on the... Oh, this is a regular HBAC third meeting. Thursday this week. It's the last it's the Thursday meeting. of the month. Okay, because then we also have the state... The pox is that's on the 30th. Yeah, okay. That's, that's the 30th. 5 o'clock, right. I believe. Okay, Maybe 5 o'clock. Right. But I think it's 5. 5 o'clock. And nope. that's at the shell. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mark, uh, we've, we've all been up there, and this was before I was uh, elected as a state representative. Um, and I spoke both as a state representative, and I've been speaking as a selectman about this issue for five years. And uh, when you're a selectman, the state doesn't listen to you. When you're representative, the governor listens to you. People of town expect you to speak on their behalf. Uh, and it hasn't been done. And we called some people out last week, and we gave some advance notice. There was no cheap shot. There was no I got you moment. The minority leader was briefed that a week later there would be a, a PowerPoint presentation at the Hampton Board of Selectmen by me, an elected representative from the people of New Hampshire. And they know what the message has been for five years. Um, the majority leader was briefed. The staff for the majority leader was instructed to brief the governor's office that was going down. The governor's office called me and uh, asked some questions about what would be the nature, and I was very direct. And again, uh, when you're a selectman down here uh, and you go to Concord, I've been up there with Mr. Welch, <clears throat> been up there with town council, uh, you get stepped on. Put in six pieces of legislation. One was to repeal the pollution control exemption. I would ask the town council to speak about the dreads uh, um, lack of communication to us about the giveaway they held uh, and this would be mr rose the dread commissioner no courtesy call to mr welch no courtesy call to the board of selectmen tell tell about the experience when the uh, uh, an, another person up there a government employee that we talked about tonight with the puc is mr welch politely and euphemistically calls people that are politically connected yeah, we, we tell tell about what happened. We were blindsided. Yeah, pretty much the uh, the uh, the die was cast before the presentation was made, basically, and uh, it's, it's very frustrating. Uh, Representative Cushing had been very forthright in trying to get this problem solved, and uh, very little was done. A lot of a lot, there was obviously a lot of lobbying done behind behind closed doors, yeah. and. Uh, were you notified, was Mr. Welch notified, was I notified that there was going to be any uh, um, a position by dread? No. No. Were we notified by any uh, a senator from the state of New Hampshire? Not at all. No. So we were blindsided by that in the position. And what does that pollution control exemption cost the taxpayers of Hampton, a, a, a tax deduction that's given to a company that simply abides by federal law and gets that tax exemption. What does that cost this town a year? Yeah, a, a great deal, and uh, the pollution control exemption was extended by uh, by DES, uh, which basically invited the company to to extend it. Uh, it was, uh, it was, it was uh, embarrassing the way that came about, and as a result, one of the tunnels uh, in which uh, the town has uh, property tax revenue before was uh, eliminated from from uh, taxation. Yeah. So I'm, I'm glad the chairman put this back on the agenda, and, I, and I, I'm thankful for Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Max Sullivan's uh, article, and I'm glad he didn't put the pictures of how the, the beach actually looks uh, and, and how bad it looks. He put some beautiful pictures of Hampton Beach, and that's what people see. They see a beautiful picture on a day that isn't what we are confronted with down there. And if you accept those standards, and the New Hampshire uh, Public Radio uh, reporter called me, and I was in Ottawa, Canada, and uh, 
Um, he called me, and, I, and, and he quoted me. I defy anybody, anybody, to go, and it was State Park in New Hampshire, and probably in New England, and see something that looks is awful, as that beach looked in that PowerPoint presentation. And that's consistent, and that's perennial. And that's not going to change by saying things are good and they're better. This is not going to change. And we called some people out. I received a, uh, an email from a staffer for the uh, majority's office today. I had surgery on my jaw last week. It's pretty sore. I'm an old guy. Uh, I drove to Concord. I didn't get mileage. I don't get paid. And I went up there and put on a suit and tie like I do here to ask uh, for an appointment with the governor because that's what I said I was going to do. And uh, I informed uh, the staffer that this was the formal request for the appointment with the governor. His email is that he went down to the governor's office and talked to her, his scheduler, his excellency's scheduler, and I requested a 10-minute meeting. And I, if I speak for more than two or three minutes, that'll be too much. And uh, that will be the essence of the meeting, is I represent uh, and speak for the people of Hampton. And Regina talks about the revenue that comes out of this place. The beach is just part of it. And Rusty and we, we held meetings today, and we talk about compensation. Just try and pay the Group 2 retirement benefits. We're going to look at this SOP coming up, this JOP, as they call it. It's a joke. It's an absolute joke. Just, just, just calculating the overtime and the, the Group 2 retirement cost for what we do down there. The state doesn't do anything. And uh, if, if you are a taxpayer uh, like some of us here on this board that have a business and uh, the Secretary of State is looking for your tax returns so you pay your taxes and it's the highest tax in the nation on business profits Mr. Chairman that people in this town that you represent and that I represent pay and that's what we get back but if you said as the Dread Commissioner has allowed as the Governor has allowed as the State Parks Director has for the 2016 financials they don't have them we don't have them yet. So maybe we should all use that standard. And we spoke about water today. We're not interested in the federal government's water standards. We're going to exceed them. We're not interested in what DES says. We're going to take care of business. We'll get stuck with that pipe. We'll do the job because this is Hampton. But we're not tolerating these standards anymore. And that includes financial transparency. And we don't get it from the state. And anyone that's served up there hasn't called anyone out on it. And they're getting called out now. And look at the election results and see how people vote. And they want a message. And I can't tell you the dozens and dozens and dozens of people, dozens of people, business owners, beach owners, every single day in the emails that I've got, from state employees included, that have provided wild proclamations, not for me, but for that message. And they're tired. And they're absolutely tired of, of that standard. And Mr. Griffin, a beach owner down there that pays his business profits tax, that does his 2016 financials, isn't going to accept this tyranny anymore. And nor am I. And I didn't, I didn't take this job for the money. And I'm not looking for a part-time job up there. And I'm not looking for a pension. I'm just going up there to serve the people of Hampton because we have a business and, it's in, and the Bean family gives back, like the Bridles, like the Woodells. And there was a, a person in the Hampton Beach Area Commission, I laughed when I read it in the article that you brought up. He said I wasn't authorized to uh, say what I said. Well, let me just tell anybody in the town of Hampton, this isn't the Soviet Union. Nobody authorizes anybody anything to say. And when we listened to Mr. Gerald's presentation with the NHMA last week, the freedom of speech is one of the most important things that this country provides, unlike other countries. And nobody from the Hampton Beach Area Commission is going to authorize a citizen, a visitor, or anybody in this country, and certainly anybody on this board, what to say and when to say it. And so that commissioner that was quoted, Mr. Chairman, uh, and whoever is talking about whatever they're talking in opinions, um, they have to get a better sense of uh, constitutional rights, and they have to get a better sense of what government takes our money from taxpayers and what they do for it. And anybody that supports those standards and anybody that wants to couch it and say that it looks good and we have pictures that don't represent what we're in the slideshow uh, has no place in government. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I, I don't want to get back and forth, but I'm just going to refute two things, if you don't mind. Uh, you've been in a third world country. I've been in a third world country. The beach looks nothing, nothing 
like a third world country at all. Nothing like a third world country at all. There are things that need to be repaired, but it does not look like a third world country. I, at I, all. Jim, I, I've been in third. I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not refuting, and, and, and I don't know what 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 places you have sailed to in a third world country, but I'm telling you, I've, I've been in third world countries that look better than that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I, I doubt it, but that's fine. And the, the only other thing is, when, when on the pollution control thing, when we all went up there, it wasn't only dread. It was a few towns also who spoke against changing the pollution control. So it wasn't only dread. Let's all let's tell a whole story. I mean, Merrimack, I'll, I'll tell the whole story, and thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, and, and, I, and I spoke with Doug it. Lay, who's on the Labor Committee, and... Uh, you know, there's people that want to legislate and want more taxpayer money, Mr. Chairman, and uh, he won't confront Anheuser Bush and say you don't deserve that. And I said I'll go confront them, and and so that's the you want to talk about the whole picture. There are people that are happy to give away pollution credits that are Democrats and Republicans, and you want to, you brought it up, so I'm asking you yeah, for time here. So I, you're saying the whole picture? I'm against the whole, it. The whole, but I'm just saying let's. May I finish? Everything. The whole you picture may. is is that. Uh, people from other towns is they're afraid to go ask because I guess they're afraid of not getting reelected again, and I'm not. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Uh, can we move on to GOP? That'll be easy. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the board uh, directed uh, myself to <clears throat> send a letter to uh, to Dread, uh, addressing a number of particular issues. Uh, one was the plowing of the parking lots in the winter time. Uh, another one was the public drinking on the beach and the cleaning up of the piles of debris that were left during the off season when we had very warm days as we had earlier this month. Um, and uh, there was also some question about uh, disallowing uh, the excrement from horses to be placed on the beach and not picked up. Um, we found, uh, we asked, I'll be, let me just read it. Um, all these items, as well as possibly others, are in need of our joint attention. Together we can resolve problem areas for the benefit of our citizens and guests and for their peaceful enjoyment of state and town property. On behalf of the board, I request that you draft provisions to be placed in the JOP that will address these issues. We are available to meet with you to discuss possible solutions. We did meet with them. They were very kind to come down and, and meet with us, and the answer to all of these was no. We're not going to put them in the JOP. They don't belong there. They're operational ideas. Um, they did say that they are starting to plow some of the parking lots as they have people and, and equipment available. Uh, but that may or may not continue depending upon their assignment of personnel at various locations and how they have to remove personnel from other locations and down here. Um, we did talk to them about cleaning the beach during the off-cycle years. Uh, they did tell us that they now own both the tractor and the beach cleaning machines. They have two of them. Uh, so, and they have no one to operate them during any time except after Memorial Day. That's, that's tough for them because they, they don't have personnel available according to them. But they are going to work on improving it, which I think is nice to say, and, and hopefully that will happen. Um, we, we also addressed to them the idea that... Um, there should not be large piles of trash just on a random basis left on the beach. It's, it's disconcerting to our residents and obviously disconcerting to other people besides our residents. Uh, they indicated that they were cleaning the, the, the material off the beach as quickly as they could. We did indicate to them that a number of our citizens went down and cleaned the beaches because they just couldn't stand the, the site at this point or at that point. Uh, they said they would try to approve that, but th they don't have personnel on hand to do that. Uh, we also discussed um, some of the complaints that we've been receiving with regards to horses on the beach and, and the fact that they, they leave their uh, droppings both on the beach and in the water. We did tell them that we have passed an ordinance that, uh, at least in our portion of the beach, would not allow that to happen, and they should advise these people to pick that up on our portion if the, the horse should leave a large deposit where it shouldn't be. They did say that they had reached a, an accommodation with the Equestrian Society of New Hampshire, and the horses are going to continue to be on the beach now and in the future. That's just the end of it, as far as they're concerned. They don't wish to start a problem with that, with that society, and the, uh, the horses are going to be there. Um, we indicated that that was unfortunate, that we would like to see some improvement in those areas, and they said that's out of their, out of their hands. So. 
What you have is the JLP in front of you that we had last year with a couple of small edits uh, and nothing else. Questions, Regina? So as far as the horse droppings, wouldn't that be, what happens if, don't we like not want waste to go into the water? I mean, does anyone? They indicated that horse droppings do not contain human carcinogens and, 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 and poisons uh, that normally come from the human body. So therefore it's, it's a situation of, uh, uh, they, the horse droppings are acceptable to them in the water and on the beach. So dog droppings are the same thing? Uh, yeah, but they're not it's acceptable. Different, I think. Yeah, they contain this different has contaminants. This before. Yeah, that comment. It's evidently there is some type of a difference between a horse and a dog. Yeah, or a or cat. Or other animal. Yeah. Maybe because they eat grass or something. I don't know. It could be. But, yeah. So, is the reason why they didn't allow any of those items to go into that JOP because they? didn't think that they, they don't have the ability to fulfill those items. One, they, don't they don't have don't the it. ability to, to take those items up and take care of them, except on a very limited basis, only when they can assign other personnel. And two, they consider them to be operational requirements, and they shouldn't be in the JOP. Okay. Yeah. My opinion is they're going to be someplace because they're not being dealt with now. Right. Well, that so, was our point, but they're, not, they're going to right. deal with them as they can, if they can. As I said before earlier, if they can, they can afford to have employees pay, pick up the meters and write tickets, they can afford to have employees pick up the trash. Well, I mean, last year the town of Hampton had engineers picking up trash, so I don't understand why the state wouldn't work in a similar type of situation. So I think the problem is not with the, again, stressing the people that are actually there every day doing the work. That's different. Completely different. They're there. The problem is the whole management aspect of it so that's something that again communication what can you do why can't you do it figure out a way to get it done because you're getting millions of dollars from us and we would like to see something back they're basically passing the buck to the employees who are there now and don't have the resources or equipment to do the work that's been requested right and that's not how you get things done not really right okay um now do you go to this meeting on the 30th, or do we have a representative from the town? Usually it's a select one to go. I'd be happy to go. It's not a problem for me. Um, they're not going to listen to me, I can tell you that. They've already demonstrated that. Say that again, Mr. Wilson. They're not going to listen to me. They've Who's already that? demonstrated that. They dread. Okay, I'm simply passing word on from this board on things that you would like to see done and they're listening to the board and not to me, and they're answering the board, not me. Uh, their, their modus operandi here is to try to operate with the board. Now, they're not able to do that in this particular case for their various reasons, and they do have a lot of reasons, but basically it boils down to they're not assigning manpower here that's sufficient to take the problem in hand and solve it. I think it's unfortunate they're having it on the 30th. Who's going to go? I'm going. Well, I'm, you know, I, I may go also because uh, the engineering Commission is trying to go. Yes. But it is Memorial Day. It's Memorial Day weekend, yeah. A lot of people are going to be traveling. There's no question. This is a one-time-a-year proposition for dread. Uh, I'm not. I'm, I'm not sure. We may be the only JOP they have. I don't know that, but certainly we are the, one of their largest facilities uh, from an income standpoint and from a population standpoint of who comes to their facility in this particular case. But to be. Oh, I'm sorry. No. <laughs> no. But I mean, you, you see what's happening. Yeah. in certain areas, and that's the best they can do temporarily at this point in time. Yeah, I mean, this is this is pretty much a Mickey Mouse document. Um, I don't support it. I've, I've looked at it for five years. Uh, I've got some, some questions, uh, Mr. Welch. Uh, how does this uh, um, comply or not comply with the uh, 
the base document, the founding document of the uh, 1933 agreement with the uh, state of New Hampshire that I've requested a copy of. And I'll, I'll get one from legislative uh, services. We should have already received one. Yeah, I, I probably, it, it's probably buried. I've been, yeah. We'll give um, another one. That's so, yeah, not a big it, deal. It, it, has there been a uh, cross check on that? Uh, the statute provides uh, that we will exchange the beach for certain things that they will maintain the seawall, okay, which they have finally done, uh, built it at least to standards of several years ago, and it's now cracking already. Uh, they will, uh, the town will take care of policing and sanitation. That means law enforcement and sewer waste. Nothing in there about trash, but we, we, we managed to take a lot of trash, and, and we've worked out a position where they actually pay for that at our rate. So we're actually not paying anything for it as far as the tipping is concerned, but we, of course, have manpower that operates that as well. Um, other than that, there's nothing. We have no jurisdiction there. Absolutely none, unless they invite us. That includes the police department for all intents and purposes. They have to invite us to be there. They are the sovereign, and we are not. We are nothing when you start talking about the sovereign. Mm -hmm. it. It's a different type of concept that most people don't understand. Yeah. It goes back to Charles II. <laughs> but that's, that's a little old for our current needs. And, um, uh, I'll look for that so I can do my own analysis. And this is the joint operations plan for 2017. Was there a meeting um, with uh, DREAD officials, state park officials, regarding this recently? That was the meeting we held in, re in response to uh, the letter I sent and the, the four or five items that the board wanted addressed. And what was, what was the outcome of that meeting? Uh, they would like to change some of the requirements in this. Uh, we said no. What did they want to change? They wanted to have all of their um, waste from the beach hauled and put in dumpsters on the, at the transfer station. Uh, when we went through that process a year ago and we said we weren't going to do that, it was because the Attorney General's office said in order to do that, they would have to receive certain uh, um, deeded rights to that property because they weren't going to build anything or put any equipment down there unless they had rights of easement over that property for certain things. And we said, no, we can't do that and take a town meeting to do it or the board. And we had no intention of proposing such a, because they would just be able to walk in and do whatever they wanted and we'd have no control. Um, those are the sorts of things that we put up with in this, this particular situation. Mm -hmm. uh, we finally worked out trash and how that's done and um, it requires a lot of work on our part. We have to purchase special bags to see uh, those things that are picked up by the state forces. Uh, we do charge them for them, but we have to purchase them. We have to install them. We have to make sure they're out there every, every day. Mm -hmm. um, there are little things that we've had to do to accommodate that makes, makes work more unpleasant for us. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to sweep the entire state park. All those roads are swept down there every day by Public Works Department. Under the new MS4 requirements, we're supposed to be sweeping our own streets and don't have a chance to do that in accordance with the federal requirements that are currently being issued. Mm -hmm. We're down there sweeping the beach. If we didn't do it, then all that waste would end up sitting on the streets down there. Got it. Got it. No, they do a great job on that. Uh, they do pick up. Pick up's very good. Yeah. We keep it very clean. I know you do. Um, D Director Bryson, his, his uh, article with Max, talked about the uh, the bond schedule, and I'm, I'm happy to discuss that bond schedule with anybody, the governor, anybody, uh, as it compares to Canon. And if you look at the numbers that Regina talked about, just from the meters, if you go 50 years and you look what was not reinvested into the, into the town of Hampton, um, it's the equivalent of modern-day dollars in the last um, 50 years, when you l use these projections from this year, of $100 million. $100 million. And when they went and they did uh, finally do some reinvestment, and we, we more than matched their investment here in town to, to accommodate that, um, uh, they borrowed the money. They borrowed the money. They didn't spend the real money. They borrowed it. They didn't take it out of the way. They bonded it. 
and I'm happy to discuss that. And it, Max was uh, kind enough to put that in there, but I found that interesting. And Rick's absolutely right. And when you look at the financials, they don't, they don't provide the uh, the money that should be provided to the park. So uh, uh, further looking at this is titled Joint Operations Plan 2017. Uh, 2017 has 12 months. Did you um, uh, see anything in here about plowing uh, and amortizing operation uh, capabilities throughout the year? No, they indicated that uh, they have been doing some plowing mm -hmm. <clears throat> and they have been doing some sidewalk areas, principally around the pavilions and so forth, mm -hmm. so people would be able to walk because it's obvious a lot of people in Hampton and surrounding towns come here to walk. Mm -hmm. uh, we asked them, yeah, are they going to plow the rest of the parking lots? They said, well, we have plowed a few, but the problem is we don't have any equipment to pick up the snow and remove it. We just put it in piles and the piles get bigger and bigger depending on how much snow there is. Mm -hmm. um, we did ask if they were going to do all of the sidewalks on the ocean side, uh, and they said we did go down and do the ones on the North Beach once, mm -hmm. and they did do the ones from the War Memorial down to uh, the Bend uh, on one occasion. But that's very difficult for them to do. Uh, the employee comes in uh, late so that when people want to use the facility, he's not here to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they, they simply don't dedicate the resources. And uh, in terms of a place to put it, uh, we know when we had the uh, mother of all winters a couple of years ago, they have the entire state park uh, by, by the pavilion to uh, store, and it won't degradate the, uh, the environment nor the, uh, the water. They, they can put it there. Uh, so they, they didn't talk about any uh, winter operations. They're going to do, they said they'll do the best they can to clear mm -hmm. or to plow. Mm -hmm. They said that they were concerned that people were parking in those parking lots and it hindered their plowing at some certain times. Mm -hmm. One of the suggestions I've made to them before is that if they picked up all the snow and put it down the south, the south beach in the parking lot down there, they could probably have some winter activities like snowmobile races and gymkhanas and so on and so forth. But they don't have. They say they don't have the equipment or the manpower to do that. Okay. Yeah. Again, this is uh, this is the same old stuff. It's it's not there, there's an existing uh, relationship that we have, and it, it, it this this just deals with trash and uh, raking the beach, and, and really doesn't say much. It's it's really not worthy of effort of people that uh, are engaged in the people's work with their tax money. And I'll be addressing it with the governor, which is Phil Bryce's boss, and. Uh, um, the Dread Commission's boss, and of course their boss is the people that uh, put people in office like me to go up there and have a word with them directly about this stuff because um, you don't get anything done with this, and you never will. And uh, finally, when you start calling people out, Mr. Chairman, uh, is when things start happening. Thank you very much. It's actually Chairman. the status quo document. Okay, I have a, I have a question. Sure. If we don't sign it? You don't sign it. I mean, nothing's going to nothing change. Nothing changes. Nothing changes. For all intents and purposes, nothing changes. <clears throat> but they decide because we didn't sign this, for instance, they're not going to pay to bring trash into the transfer station, they're not going to get the transfer station. I mean, see the status quo, and, and I don't see the change. So the status quo stays the status quo. As far as I'm concerned, yes. They may have a different opinion, they may take a different action, but I don't see how they can. First of all, we're not obligated under the 1933 statute to even pick the trash up. That's, that's as plain as the nose in your face, and we can get pictures out of the old sewer lines that used to run across the beach. That's what they wanted to get rid of. But we're obligated to business owners in town to pick up. They're business owners. It. They're 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 outside the purview of the state. Right, right. But right. I'm saying, I mean, saying we're, we're and we pick their trash to get up. trash trash off the beach. I mean, off oh, our, our side of the off beach. Our, off the side, our of, side of the beach. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Our, our road. Yeah. yeah. I have a board. question. <clears throat> um, I just was thinking of this when I was driving along this week, and uh, not, it has something to do with this conversation. In Rye, uh, I guess it's Rye, maybe Northampton too, where instead of seawalls, they have those big piles of uh, rocks yes. that work as yeah. a seawall. Who pays for all of that? Is that's, that a, that's all the state property. So that's all, they have control of all those beaches down there too? No, not all of them. Some of those are town beaches. 
So the state actually builds those rock. I think they were built in order to protect the state highway. And those towns aren't responsible for any of that? I haven't seen any of those towns, and maybe Public Works should tell us. That. I haven't seen them being responsible for that. That's state. Okay, so state. I was just curious about that and how it might relate to how we do things here in Hampton. Yeah, well, they were obligated to put a seawall up here, and they did. And they've just redone that. That's the way it used to look back before they put the metal wall in yeah. front of. So Hampton's the only one that has a seawall? Pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. And Representative Cushing, if I may, Mr. Chairman, makes, makes an excellent point about this, is that this belongs in the highway budget. Uh, at the state level, if there's no seawall, there's no there's no state road. It, it doesn't it doesn't have to be gummed. Oh, we built you a seawall in Hampton. It's got nothing to do with that. It's 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 shedding money out of the state budget. Is what they're doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things we've heard them talk about is the fact they could make a lot more money and do a lot more things down there if they basically built a wall down the entire length of the beach and charged everybody to get in in addition to the parking. And then the second point, Mr. Chairman, if I may, is uh, they say they don't have the equipment. What lies right up uh, by units hill? Is, what, what's up there that's, for state that's, assets? That's DOT. And, and state assets and heavy equipment, dump trucks by the dozen, by the dozen, by the dozen, by the dozen. You, you've got to understand what they've done. That's not that's Turnpike and DOT. That's, and what go, that's what governors are here for, to issue orders for people to do stuff. What they've done here is they've shedded that responsibility off DOT and put it onto a revenue-making agency so it comes out of the state budget so they have other money to spend other places. Read you loud and clear. Thank you. Do we have a motion on the DOP? So I would make a motion, motion that we don't, we do not uh, accept it. Don't even have to make a motion. You're going to do that. Uh, I'd like to make a motion that we don't accept it. I'll second that motion. Okay. okay all in favor of not accepting the GOP? Right and opposed. I'm opposed to it. But It'll always sit in the back burner. Yep. That's why I'll get it. So four one was it? Was it okay? Four one. Um, okay. Next new business: bicentennial seawall design of private okay, 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 One more item under uh, old business. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Mr. Silverdick had uh, sent an email several weeks ago. And, uh, Rusty. Chairman Bridal is on the uh, cable committee. The chairman and I spoke today, but he has some ideas. And I just wanted, as a personal courtesy to him, Mr. Chairman, I know you, you wanted as well, that he'll be coming in to address some of his ideas uh, at a later selectman's state. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Bicentennial Seawall Design of Permitting Bidding Documents for Replacement A, Amendment to Engineering Services, RFQ 2. 2016-008 tie in bond yes so what I have before you and what I'm requesting is authorization for the town manager to sign the contract from tie in bond this contract would be an amendment to their original contract which they were selected under an RFQ process to do the whole investigation of Bicentennial uh, tie in bond was the company that uh, helped us do the emergency stabilization repair uh, that was done in January earlier this year. They've done all the geotechnical work, produced the report that is all on the website. Uh, they've put together preliminary design options for us. Uh, and this contract covers the decision of the final design, which way we go, um, looking at those alternatives, vetting them out, uh, looking at their cost implications, uh, what's best for the town of Hampton, taking those drawings, putting them into final documents uh, for bid purposes, as well as obtaining all the permits, uh, what we asked for from the town people uh, through the warrants earlier this March. Um, this contract is for $110,000. Um, it is a lump sum contract. The warrant article was approved for $120,000. Uh, we have left the money purposely for reimbursable expenses, i.e. copies, permit fees, other items that will come up during the permitting process. Uh, so with that, that is what I am here for. Okay. Questions from the board? Anybody? Yes, I, I have two questions. Okay. One, one, Mr. Chairman, uh, you say it's an amended contract. I've read it. Is, is, what, what is the change? Is it just the price figure? What is it? Uh, the change is adding this task. So originally we started with preliminary and investigation. And because we already had a contract, 
Um, we also have a general services contract with them with all the terms and conditions. We're adding these additional, the final design, permitting, bid document, if you want to call them tasks. Spending the scope of work. Spending the scope of work. And the price is 110. That's what we're expanding. And, and uh, that is under what was previously? It's under what was approved through town warrant. That was town. 120, correct? correct? Wonderful, wonderful work, great work. And uh, secondly, um, I, I've expressed it uh, to Mr. once before, but those stones that are in front of the wall, if that's incorporated, yeah, I'm no engineer, but I would think it would in, you know, reinforce uh, the life expectancy of the wall, and it looks really nice. Well, and, and those, so that money that was previously invested this past fall, that will not be lost, i.e., and that those stones are going to be reused, we believe, in the final design. And We're expecting it. Okay, yeah, if the, I don't know, if Mr. The Chairman... Right, the, it's, the, it's armor protection for whatever gets there. And aesthetically, it, it looks great, and it's a nice means of egress and ingress. I do think it's very important just to note that that was a temporary stabilization. That wall that is behind those stones still has all the same problems uh, it originally did as far as embedment and the concrete deteriorating and those type of things. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And you went through the whole bid process? So we went through the qualification-based selection when we originally vetted uh, engineers that do this type of work. So when we were vetting them for the investigative um, portion, so doing the geotechnical testing, the preliminary design, we also were asking of their capabilities to take it all the way through, um, mainly because it doesn't make sense to switch engineers when they've done a good job for you the first time and have all the history on the project. Okay. Any other questions from the board? A motion? So moved. Second. All in favor? Okay, and then two. Anything else under that? No? Two. Uh, bid award 2017-007 landfill and transfer station <laughs> fencing to platinum fence. Yes. Um, this was a um, bid package that I had directed Jim Hafey, our engineer, uh, to put together. Um, we went out and, and the reason we asked, I asked him to do it was uh, multi-purpose, and one of the biggest things is uh, the southern end of the of our existing landfill is uh, wide open. Uh, for the last two years, we've had repeated incidents of um, the perimeter being accessed and torn up, if you will, with four wheelers. Uh, we're gated on the Hard Art Road side. We're gating on the land. The roadside, there's some areas on the back adjacent to Tide Mill Road that are pretty wet. You'd have to swim to get through. But there's a number of sections that are very accessible. Um, and we've been written up for that in the, uh, this is only a three-page portion of the annual report that uh, this group that we've contracted with ATC uh, did and submitted to the, to the state. And it identifies in a number of instances uh, ATVs continue to access the landfill by circumventing the concrete barriers placed on the edge of the access road. Um, this is in the southeast section. Uh, at some point, one of those or continued access points is going to lead to erosion. The erosion would get us in a, in a adversarial role with DES with respect to you know maintaining the integrity of our landfill. So, in a proactive measure. I asked um, to have uh, Jim draw this up. We went out to bid with, uh, we notified at least 10 vendors and we received six bids, the highest being 62,370, the lowest being 34,290. I'll make that motion. I'll second. Do you want to say anything else or no? You platinum, said uh, we're going with platinum fence, the one that the low bidder, but they're also the bidder that put up the all the other sections of fence. Uh, we've had great luck with them. And they're a good company. Just just to clarify, this this doesn't have to go through the board because it's not fifty thousand dollars. The reason it's here is because legally you are responsible for the landfill as the chief executive officer of the town. So we want to make sure before we do this kind of construction work that in fact you concur in it. I'll make that motion. And I second that. All in favor? Yeah, deal. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Closing comments? We have to go back into non-public session for one second. Okay. Uh, but up, up. 
Potter Pop. <laughs> Give us, get us back in the non-public. What do we have to? We have can we? To, can we do it from? Did you recess or adjourn the prior mm -hmm. session? Recessed. You recessed. We adjourned. We adjourned. Yeah. Uh -uh. Good night, guys. Thank you. We need to go back through the hey, same Jan. process. Well, I thought we could and come out of it. We could get. We could get if you recess, you can come out of it and go back into it, but not oh, okay. if you adjourn. So you can make a motion to go <laughs> under yeah. RSA 91A. Colon oh, you get it right three. there. 91A colon 32A. Okay, to go back into non-public session. Okay. Uh, roll call. Second. I'll second. Okay, roll call. Aye. All right. All right. All right. Just should we do a motion to seal of those minutes? Thanks. <laughs> you guys are the boss, not me. <laughs> That's why we need to. Yeah. Good night, Fred. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Channel 22. Well, that's all the most, yeah. What was the, what uh, was guys. the most water? Seal of nuts? Yeah. yeah.